Welcome, Austin. This is my new podcast called The Biz, where I'm trying to have you know various professionals in the industry give their unique experiences to other professionals in the Bitcoin world. Um, trying to find you know some rare information that is useful to people, not just the normal standard fare of you know celebrity podcast guests that do the tours on every show. I think maybe the best way to start with you, and I have a lot of questions I want to ask, and I want to I don't want this to take forever. So maybe let's start with you know a chronological kind of approach to where maybe you could tell me a little bit first of all about yourself and how how you would you know intro yourself, but then you know starting with total net getting into zero knowledge systems, et cetera, and I'll ask some questions on those. Sure, and thanks for the opportunity, John. I'm an entrepreneur, I would say more first and foremost. I uh, had an interest in computer security, and in the mid, kind of early 90s, I kind of grew up in the BBS scene, kind of that age of, you know, pre-internet, uh, playing around with the early internet, uh, kind of, you know, just exploring and small hacking. And when I was a teenager, I kind of saw some friends get jobs as security consultants, kind of the first wave. And that was on the back of uh, something called Operation Sun Devil, which was the, it kind of led to the creation of EFF. It was kind of the FBI cracking down on hackers and doing a nationwide raid of anyone with computer skills. And I had a couple of associates and friends who got caught up in that. So I got a very strong interest in online civil liberties, privacy. Uh, and on the back of that, I started doing computer security consulting as a teenager, as a business. You know, at one point, I realized that security consulting was limited by the hours in the day. And I moved on from that and decided to start an internet provider right at the dawn of the internet. So kind of a retail consumer internet provider for listeners in the North America, that, similar to like a Netcom or an Earthlink. Started that, ended up partnering with my brother, who uh, had a bit more of a business school background. He kind of left university and joined me as my partner. And we grew that from kind of 1994 to 97 as one of the largest internet providers in Canada, and then sold that company. That's really cool. Like, part of me is a little bit jealous of your story because I also started in the early BBS days, except what I did was I like I traded Pearl Jam bootleg live recordings of cassette tapes with people. And I played like the early <laughs> like text only, you know, role playing games and things like this and ran up my parents' prodigy bill and stuff like that. And, you know, it's funny how we've all like, we took totally separate paths in our lives as, as our listeners will learn. But then, you know, we all, we both did end up coming back around to Bitcoin as well. Um, so I guess total net, you, you sold the company and then I, I assume the next thing was zero knowledge systems. And this is like yeah. a really cool story that I think is definitely under told in the Bitcoin world. And I think that you're very underrepresented as far as your history and role in like, you know, the past and what led up to, you know, Bitcoin and cryptography products and stories. So maybe you can tell me a little about, a bit about the start of zero knowledge systems and what it was about. Sure. I was in my early 20s at this point. We had sold a business and had a little bit of cash, you know, certainly not life retiring, but, you know, more money than I had ever kind of anticipated having at my disposal. And the concerns over internet privacy were pretty widespread. You know, people still weren't using credit cards online. And a lot of that was just fear of something new. But I kind of really believed that there was an opportunity at the time to build some very strong privacy tools that did for online privacy, what the internet browser did for information access. So the kind of the thesis or the idea was, what if we took the best cypherpunk technologies, some of which didn't even exist, but at the time there was only PGP and you, ha you had to be a very good computer user who understood command lines and, uh, you know, a lot of sophistication to get PGP up and running. And my, my thesis was, what if we made that as easy as just starting Netscape browser? So the same way Netscape Browser made encryption for shopping with SSL transparent and just available, we thought we could do the same thing with online privacy. But the privacy tools we wanted to bring were uh, online network level anonymity. So what we currently know as Tor. So at the time, we called it the Freedom Network. But no one had ever built this. This was only theorized in some cypherpunk writings uh, referring to DC Nets or PipeNet by David Schoem and a few others had written up the idea that you could reroute packets through a series of relays 
and encrypt at multiple stages so you could hide who you were. And so the starting idea was if we do network level encrypted anonymity that doesn't leak anything about yourself, and then on top of that, give people the ability to create unique digital pseudonyms that are totally untraceable, that even we, the company, can't associate with you. And then on top of that, we give them electronic cash, digital cash. We thought we would have this trifecta. You could go online, be totally anonymous at the network layer, adopt a pseudonym to establish email relationships, and you could have one for your health, one for shopping, and kind of separate out your digital identities where no one, including us, could associate. And then you could shop using electronic cash. That was overly broad and very ambitious, but we wanted to do it. So we, uh, we raised actually around $80 million leading up to and including to the year 2000. We hired an incredible team of researchers and cypherpunks. Our chief scientist was Dr. Ian Goldberg, who was pretty famous at the time as one of the leading cypherpunks, cryptographers. He's now a professor at University of Waterloo, still doing some incredible work. He invented the OTR protocol for IRC chat. He's you know done a bunch of stuff. We had Adam Back, who we hired, who many people in the Bitcoin community obviously know. We hired him for his work on Hashcash and anonymity and crypto systems. We got a hold of the patent suite by Dr. Stefan Brands, who was a protege and a PhD candidate student of D- David Schoem. And it was the only other way to do digital cash at the time. Um, so there was the Shom patent suite and there was the Brands patent suite. And we actually tried to buy even the DigiCash. So we, we were kind of working on all these efforts to roll out an entire privacy suite. And, you know, we went to battle with the FBI. We went to battle with the U.S. government because we were exporting this from Canada. And at the time, it was illegal in the United States to export strong crypto. So the company garnered a lot of attention. But... It turned out the market wasn't there. And so when the dot-com crash hit, we found ourselves with 280 employees, a very high burn rate, and a bunch of really cool technology, but none of it generating enough revenue to actually build a business. I read like the story that you shared with me that was in text. I'm not sure if it was ever published or where it came from, but, you know, it covered a lot of these things about zero knowledge systems. And one thing that it makes clear is that this company had a lot of hype. Like there was a lot of hope and and like kind of prediction that this would this could really be the next big tech company. Like how did how did you go from total net and you know uh, you know what sounded like a reasonable you know cash out and, and selling of that company to getting something that that was able to fund so much money um, in, in such a kind of short amount of time and get so much appeal? Like like was it just different then? Were, were just more investors like more excited about? a product like this? I think it was a combination of things. Certainly, it, the environment was very frothy, if you will. Mm-hmm. But we've seen frothy environments come and go, and we've seen other ones since, in terms of total dollar amount that have exceeded the dot-com rush. But certainly in the dot-com rush, we saw, you know, there's a saying that in a tornado, even pigs fly. And so you saw a lot of good and bad ideas get money thrown at them, whether it was, you know, pet food online, pets.com. And we hear about the disasters. But inside of that, there were some companies that were very ambitious, who were really trying to do some great things. Some of them just made execution of mistakes or timing mistakes. In many respects, you know, I still get emails from people saying, I just saw this happen online. I wish zero knowledge and freedom still existed. So some would say we were too early. Because a lot of that privacy concern that was expressed by people didn't translate into market demand because people didn't understand privacy and security. But I was able to tap into something that was all over the media. So everyone was talking about privacy. You know, I I was on the advisory board of the Electronic Privacy Information Center. I knew my topics. I was credible. So, um, you know, I kind of became a kind of a media talking head. So I was on 60 Minutes. I was, we purposely and consciously associated ourselves with a cause that we really believed in, our employees believed in. We had lifelong cypherpunks pick up and move from California to Montreal because they wanted to join the mission. I think that kind of advocacy and passion does attract a lot of attention. And we were at a turning point in the internet where we literally predicted the rise of surveillance capitalism. And we were yelling and screaming to say, if we don't develop a, a commerce model for the internet, that doesn't depend on people's data. If we don't have a mechanism for paying for things and conducting 
business online that doesn't force you to reveal your identity, then the future of the internet is going to be based off this massive, undermining, socially corrosive business model. And that attracted a lot of attention when you're yelling, the end is coming, kind of chicken little scream uh, scream of fear. People sometimes pick up and pay attention. They don't always do anything, as we're seeing with other things <laughs> you know, going on globally today. But it did get us attention. And I was good at raising money. I mean, that's one thing I... You know, I was good at packaging a message to investors and saying, believe in this. And there were examples. So I was able to raise money pretty effectively for a young man in his 20s from Canada. I ended up raising money from Silicon Valley investors, from, you know, investors all around the world. And, you know, I had some incredible partners and coaches who helped me in that. Yeah, I have a quote here from you uh, regarding this surveillance capitalism, and, and I watched some other like keynotes you did where you, where you mentioned quotes like this, but it basically says, everyone says they care about privacy, but people would give a DNA sample for a free Big Mac. <laughs> and I, I think that that was definitely, you know, turned out to be pretty much true. I mean, we haven't quite gotten to the DNA part, but we did, you know, we do have like Ancestry.com and people literally sending their DNA away. Um, and, and probably to, and this is getting them, you know, discounted services for such. It's an unfortunate side effect that we, we learned, which was, you know, we attracted kind of a black helicopter crowd, if I will. And I don't mean that in a demeaning way. You know, there is a group of people who are very conscious of OPSEC, privacy, security, whether it's because they watch X-Files and they believe there's the truth is out there and there's some bad boogeyman or they're just conscious uh, about data and understand the risks. They're, that is a very small segment of the population. The broader population are people who when you ask them about privacy, will absolutely say, I, I totally am afraid of privacy. Some of the same people, by the way, who you ask them if you care about the environment, they're like, it's the biggest threat to the planet. You find those same people on a different day, and they'll give a DNA sample in exchange for a free Big Mac, and they pile into a massive SUV and don't care about anything about their carbon footprint. So because these threats are ephemeral, and they're so postponed from the consequence of an action, it's very hard for people to do anything distinct about it. So it turned out what people really wanted was more security than privacy. They wanted to protect themselves against viruses and active threats. And so we had to change the company to reflect that. I have another quote here where, where you mentioned that same concept where you said, uh, freedom was like a seatbelt for cars that don't ever crash or medicine for a disease that no one ever gets. And so it's a, it was a really hard product to, I guess, get people to, to sign up for it and, and pay for since you mentioned it, I want to I want to make sure that the audience gets to hear the story of Ian Goldberg and the Pentium Three. Yeah, well, this was a group effort, but when we were getting started, when we were still working on the main software, it took us a lot longer to build than we thought because we had to establish, you know, essentially the infrastructure for the what you know is very similar to what we see in Tor. Um, by the way, we did not invent Tor; we invented a parallel, very similar uh, comparative system. At the same time, some of the guys at the Naval Research Laboratory worked on Tor. And Ian Goldberg actually went on after he left our company to run the Tor open source project. But the Pentium came out when the dawn of kind of e-commerce online, and we're pushing this Pentium serial number, which was a unique serial number, a unique identifier embedded on your microchip. And they had web widgets that would allow you to authenticate based off your CPU. And anyone in computer security world knew this was a horrible idea. It's horrible as an authentication method because you never know who's behind a computer. You never know who owns a computer. You don't know if the computer's been rooted. And it's horrible for, it's horrible in so many respects. It's only effective use can be the gradual degradation of privacy, which is a unique chipped serial number, a cookie on your computer chip that doesn't get erased or can't be changed. And Intel made a bunch of claims about how this would only be read with your permission and no website could ever track you without you knowing. And I mean, this was like the largest CPU manufacturer. And at the time, AMD had hardly any market share. And we were just like, this should not be the dominant method of proving who you are online. It's horrible. And so we had uh, Ian Goldberg and also another one of our lead developers, a, a gentleman by the name of Mario Contestabil, who is our, one of our top kind of programmer hackers, they kind of fooled around with it and they wrote an exploit that would allow a website to read your serial number without you ever knowing. So it kind of over, overwrote the BIOS settings that were supposed to protect your privacy. 
And we did this just to show the world, hey, all their claims about how this is protected and how it won't harm you is kind of bullshit. Intel did not react well to a bunch of, you know, kind of hackers and computer security people in Montreal showing that their entire new CPU line that was already shipping had a massive exploit and flaw. So kind of butted heads with them. They they labeled all of our software and Semantic and McAfee as malware <laughs> so that even, even our legitimate users... And it, uh, it, I mean, this was just a security exploit demonstration that purposely says you're running an exploit demo. And but they took our legitimate software and got us listed as viruses. Same thing happens with Bitcoin today. There's there's some guys on Twitter that sometimes will report if they uh, they know the process for reporting uh, false positives for, for Bitcoin. And I've had it happen to me a few times with different malware uh, scanners and things like this, where they'll say that, that the Bitcoin uh, connection that is trying to make this is malware and it tries to stop it. So it, it, it never stopped. I guess this, this kind of thing is still happening with even the evolution of the same kind of software that, that you guys were working on, what it, what it has become today. Um, what, you know, you mentioned a little bit about freedom, but maybe you can tell me a little bit about it as a product, what it was, you know, the, the concept of, you know, cryptographic NIMS, how it worked, you know, what, what was, what you were trying, what were you trying to accomplish and what was like the pitch for this? I mean, the pitch changed over time, but at, at its base level, we had a local desktop proxy. So we installed a firewall on your machine. The firewall was programmed with us, uh, you know, essentially a set of your personal information. And anytime you were in private mode, not only would we block any of that personal information from going out. So if you accidentally went and entered a form, for instance, and you just by habit, you type in your name or your address, we would warn you and say, hey, you're in private mode. Would you like to replace that? with your pseudonym. And your pseudonym was an email address. So it could, you know, whatever you chose, bob at freedom.net. And each one of those email addresses was a cryptographic NIM. It was kind of based off the same system that the cypherpunks had developed for mailing list and participation in Usenet. So you had these systems of kind of reply blocks. It was like kind of a reverse onion routing for email addresses where we never knew your email address. And so even if someone served us with a subpoena, we could not tell them who was behind a given pseudonym. And so each pseudonym had its own cookies, had its own email address, and it had its own kind of online profile. So on the computer, the only thing a user would do was choose a pseudonym so they could choose their online identity. I'm sure many people do this if they have multiple Twitter accounts or multiple Reddit accounts. They just choose the identity they're going out. But every time you chose an identity, we would reconnect you to the internet, sorry, to your local network relay. So we would reestablish essentially a routing infrastructure through the Freedom Network that would make you anonymous again. We would switch all your cookies and all your outgoing email would be digitally signed with your pseudonym's public key. So we kind of took the aspects of PGP. And if a pseudonym was ever writing an email to another pseudonym, they would automatically look up each other's public key and you'd have encrypted mail-to-mail -mail communication. Now, that was the working product we had. And the idea was to then give them commerce. And so we actually had a couple partnerships where we were trying to develop electronic cash and deploy uh, electronic cash on top of that, which ran into its own problems. Now you even got IS, like ISPs to sign off for this. Like I see that you had sixty-five different ISPs that signed up to be service providers on the Freedom Network. I don't even think that's something that you could accomplish today to make a product like this that would get ISPs on board and get them to like run hardware for you and pay fees and promises of of, of profits in the future. Like what was what was that like? Do you think that? Do you think that was a design flaw, or do you think that was you know? Are there any cool stories about how you got these ISPs involved? Well, they were good and bad. So you need to remember, this was still at the time of dial-up. So home users did not have high-speed broadband connections that they could run relays. DSL and cable, this is where I, I think part of this was a timing issue. Mm -hmm. Because certainly in our vision, we always had that we would release the, net, uh, the node software, essentially the relay software that would let you run a Freedom node. We would release it open source and let anyone run it. But initially, we needed ISPs to buy into this because they had the backbone infrastructure and because it was already quite slow because, you know, we were starting to wrap uh, your browsing traffic in multiple layers of encryption and you only had 56K 
uh, you know, a dial up bandwidth capacity. So we were already using 20% of that in encrypted packet overhead and wrapping all your packets with multiple layers. So for performance and speed, we needed from a network topology point of view, we needed nodes distributed locally with ISPs, entry nodes, and we needed lots of them to make up a critical mass of the network. Now, thankfully, at that time, there were still a fair amount of independent ISPs, and we knew a lot of them, uh, or some of them, at least in our geography. But I had also had some relationships. So like, you know, some of the first internet providers in Japan uh, were, you know, friends of ours. Uh, Amsterdam had a whole bunch of, you know, ex-hacker, you know, Access for All ran the largest ISP, and those are all ex-hacker, really great guys, very into civil liberties and freedom. And the issues were very strong. People cared about the future of the internet and had already been doing battle with the FBI over things like the Clipper chip and Kalia, which was, you know, communication access for law enforcement. So fighting for encryption keys. So by going to ISPs and saying you can run a node and you can promote to your users uh, that you are supporting their freedom and supporting their right to encrypt, uh, that became just a good selling point. And we subsidized some of the network. Initially, um, we went to ISPs and said, hey, while we're getting this up and running, we don't mind paying you a couple hundred bucks a month just to, uh, for some of your hosting costs. But most of them did it out of their own goodwill. They just wanted to be able to market to their users and say, we care about your privacy. We're not spying on you. You had mentioned um, that the, the Freedom had a kind of strategy where you wanted to tie it into shopping or, or commerce and that you have you, you, know, you, you hired people to work on eCash products. And I see that you had, you know, you called your team uh, the evil geniuses and they, had, they, they were working on an eCash called Zorkmid. Uh, what is that and what happened with that? We had seen the demise of DigiCash. Um, so DigiCash at this point had, uh, and David Showman, we actually had a couple employees who worked for DigiCash. You know, so we had some insight into some of the mistakes that were made there. You know, many people in the Bitcoin world know, obviously, that DigiCash and the brand's technologies were based off the idea of blinded signatures with a central mint that would authorize your tokens. And so you had to have some sort of issuing authority or issuing entity that, you know, was the trusted central authority. And we now know that that was a horrible design, given all things, because of the centralization effect of having a central issuer and a mint. And, you know, it also did not address any of these models, didn't address with the monetary freedom aspects that Bitcoin provides as sound money. But for digitally signed tokens that had privacy and anonymity at its core, so the bank and the receiver of tokens couldn't trace you, but it solved the double spending problem. This was the known and only available method. So when we got access to the patent suite, we were interested in it for two reasons. One for its eCash potential, the other one for its identity credentials. Because with blind signatures, you can do things like prove you're over 18, prove you're a citizen of Canada, but prove that you're not a member of XYZ group. So you can do these complex either or and statements with identity credentials a potential future for how to prove identity without proving your real passport, physical space, meat space name. So we built this into a toolkit, a kind of a developer toolkit. And we followed the model of kind of RSA when they were licensing their B-Safe encryption toolkit. So, you know, you would see lots of different companies who had applications to use it. Because we knew as a software company, we didn't have the leverage to launch our own bank or to distribute. No one would trust us to be the mint who was creating a new zero knowledge e-bucks. You know, the same way at the time you had a bunch of companies try and launch their own virtual coins with flus and all sorts of kind of to- centralized token commerce models. We didn't like that. So our approach was go to the banks and go to the big companies who have users. And we started working with the mobile companies because at the time mobile was just getting started as a viable platform. This is circa like 2000, 2001. We had projects with a couple of the big, large handset manufacturers. You know, at the time, those were, you know, Nokia, Ericsson, who had, you know, tons of users. The screen couldn't really support, you know, credit cards. They were trying to push for, you know, phones to be a payment gateway and a wallet. So we had a couple active projects where we were being paid to develop pilots to use cell phones as kind of your portable wallet because you could do a private key and you had the infrastructure. And the idea was eventually, if we got billions of cell phones equipped with eCash, 
we could then carry it over online and that you could have your telco carriers be mints because a telco carrier in any given country has the currency, has the currency conversion, has your cre- uh, credit card. So you could just top off your e-cash balance with your carrier and then go spend that anonymously online and no one could ever link it back to you or associate. So that was the model we were pursuing. But once the dot-com crash ha- happened, every single pilot project got canceled. And, you know, there's just no demand, no interest, no funding. And so ultimately, we were kind of left with this cost basis, which is all these researchers and programmers with no prospects and no revenue for how we could do anything with it. It's so crazy because in the context of like where we are today with Tether and zero knowledge proofs, and even, you know, some years ago now with M-Pesa, it's like, it sounds like you had so many aspects right in in your thinking, but maybe it was just all about the timing because, you know, Tether obviously proved to be very successful and centralized and to and provide utility to a lot of people for a lot of money. And then M-Pesa did the same thing. And people are still today trying to figure out you creative ways to use your knowledge proofs for things like identity systems and, and other cryptograph- cryptographic products. So it's like, do you think that if, if this, if you had like approached this all 10 years later or 20 years later, that things that you, you may have like actually succeeded with zero knowledge systems? It's hard to say. It's really hard to say. Yeah. Um, I still believe, unfortunately, that privacy too often is, is not the first choice and it's not the default behavior. And we see this already. People give up their privacy today for the convenience of Gmail. Uh, they know they could go get encrypted uh, email with one of the many web-based, you know, pro-privacy encrypted email companies, but they still use alternatives that they know are spying on them or profiling them, and they just decide, oh, it's it's so much more effective. I like I like Gmail autofill. I like you know I have all my contacts. It's what I'm used to. So convenience trumps over good opsec too often for too many people. Could we have amassed the team we had? You know, by being first. We got the most incredible team, and I was mentored and surrounded by some of the best cypherpunks, cryptographers. It was just such an incredible environment to be around and come to work today. You know, I got to hang out with some of my heroes, the founders of EFF. You know, I got to hang out and spend time with Tim May and all the leaders of cypherpunks. Like, I don't regret any of it. Ultimately, we did turn it into a successful business, just not linked to the ideals as closely to the ideals as we wanted, um, which, I, I, you know, it was unfortunate. I mean, one of the most telling points is when we shut down the Freedom Network, which unfortunately was kind of in the in the months following 9-11. Um, but we had already made the decision to shut down the network because we were just bleeding cash and we couldn't afford to keep the network running. And so we decided to move away from the high cost network infrastructure and just focus on the desktop tools we had kind of build, you know, an effective kind of competitor to a Norton Internet Security or uh, a McAfee Internet Security Suite. So we licensed some antivirus and some, uh, you know, anti-spyware technology, and we just tried to build an alternative to that with different distribution mechanisms, which became successful. But when we sent a notice to all our customers saying we were shutting down the Freedom Network, a lot of them were upset. You know, it was sad, but we were dealing with population of like maybe 30,000 users which was nothing when you had an internet at the time of 150 million users. But one of the funniest calls I got was a friend of a friend who I knew had done some work for the CIA in the computer security world, reached out to me and asked me if I could keep the network running because it turns out that the CIA had been running covert ops over our network. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, they were using it to protect their privacy. And, I, you know, part of me was like, I should develop a government pricing plan, but that went against the idea of us not knowing who our customers were. Um, but the value for privacy was known to the government and known to intelligence officers and they were using it, but the average consumer never thought of it and nothing we did could really change that behavior. And I think a lot of that still exists today. I mean, we see Bitcoiners who hear time and time again of of Bitcoin thefts, yet they still keep their Bitcoin on exchanges because of convenience. Hmm. Do you have any like uh, conspiracy theories about whether or not you were already being spied on back then and that tour actually maybe was based on your work? Um, no. I mean, I, I knew the guys. Uh, we had some good interactions with the guys at NRL. Uh, Paul Syverson and some of the original authors of that paper, um, 
you know, we debated fiercely about our different approaches at a like low level, technical level. Like we were doing UDP, they were doing TCP IP sockets. You know, we had different uh, architecture scaling arguments. We actually wrote, uh, and Adam Back actually wrote, it's one of the more cited papers. We wrote detailed white papers about every way to attack our system because we believed in security through transparency, not obscurity. And so some of the most formal attacks on how do you attack an anonymity network uh, at the network layer are still from our group who thought through all the consequences and they weren't, they didn't have any solutions to those either. And some of those attacks are still being used to attack the Tor network. I respected those guys and I'm glad that the work survived in some form or another. Mm. I regret that it wasn't our system and that we couldn't figure out how to make it m- more widely available to people. I have a, an excerpt here from this, you know, this text that you gave me about zero knowledge systems, and it says zero knowledge had realized that they had to get away from the cipher, cypherpunk libertarian nutsy thing, away from being perceived as a bunch of hackers. They had to package and communicate the privacy problem in a way that wasn't scary or threatening. And you mentioned how you know the co- company ultimately did find some ways to uh, have have product success, and I, I, I wanted to ask you about. Um, blind elephant and what that product was. And it it was this like part of the transitionary process. So that wasn't necessarily the transition, but uh, it was one of, uh, it was a skunk work projects that we kicked up. If I look back in terms of business coaching, now I've done a lot of angel investing. I've done VC work. We made one of the classic mistakes and it's very easy for entrepreneurs to make, especially when they have resources is they expand too fast into multiple efforts before they get one or two things running really, really, really incredibly well and scaling. The currency of startups isn't money, it's actually focus, talent and focus, where you apply all your talent on a singular focus. We made the mistake of moving into more things. So when we saw the initial business not working as well as it could, or moving slower, being ultimate optimist, we were like, well, eventually it'll take hold. We just need to make improvements. But why don't we try some other things in parallel? And Blind Elephant was one of those. Because we were seen as privacy experts, we were getting calls from everyone, including corporate America, who were calling us and saying, hey, we got a privacy issue. Can you help us? We don't know any technologists who know privacy. They knew lawyers, but no one who had a technology background. Some of those companies were large database companies who were trying to merge data a famous example at the time was DoubleClick, who had acquired Abacus, an online marketing company, and they were being sued by the FTC over how they planned to merge that data. And they weren't the only ones. There were tons of examples of this. And so we kind of contemplated with our cryptographers being technologists. We were like, how would you solve that? If you assume that data will be collected, can you minimize the, de- the risk and the damage to both the consumer and the risk of the company? over mishandling it. And so we came up with some cool cryptography that would allow you to essentially create, you know, a a cryptographic layer of separation between the data and the linkage to start adding governance or policy at the enterprise data level. So you could start to tag different parts of your database and say, this never gets linked with that, or that only gets linked if it's anonymous and uh, can't be triangulated. And so that was the thesis behind Blind Elephant. And we actually ended up doing a couple million dollars worth of work for companies, everything from banks to online advertising companies. And some of us, some people felt like, okay, we're working for the bad guys here. But other people felt, hey, if you're helping Target, next time they get hacked, and Target wasn't hacked at this time, I'm just using it as an example. Next time a big company gets their database hacked, if it doesn't leak all the data because the leak, the data is never stored in plain text, and you can actually have higher level data at store policy and encryption, then that's good. But once again, it wasn't a focused product. It wasn't scalable. You know, it wasn't something we were able to hang our hat and run the business on. Mm -hmm. So if that wasn't really part of the transition, maybe you could tell me a bit about the products that you ended up having to pivot towards to make the company more successful after the kind of, you know, the, 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 the layoffs had to be made and these kinds of things when you had to kind of pivot, you know, I I know that there were maybe some subsidiaries created, like tell me a little bit about that time period. Sure. So a lot of this kind of came over a a series of steps over an 18 month to kind of three year period. And it was very painful. If I'm talking lessons learned, when you know you have to make hard decisions in your business, I think a lot of entrepreneurs hesitate 
to try and avoid the pain or procrastinate or kind of rip off the bandage in stages. And unfortunately, I've learned, you know, if you know a storm is coming and you know, you know, that kind of danger is on the horizon, you cut deep, cut as deep as you can as soon as you can, because it's more painful to do it in waves. But at the time, I didn't know that. We went from 280 employees down to 80. Very painful, uh, having to let go some incredible people, uh, shut down business units, let go some of the researchers, let go some of the experts and projects I was so passionate about, but we just couldn't justify. And what we ended up with was two different divisions. One got spun out into a company called Sonomos, which was doing that enterprise data consulting privacy for big business. So that became one division that uh, operated up until call it 2007, before we ultimately called it quits and shut it down. And so it was go, it would go out and bid on big projects by RFPs from banks, pharmaceutical companies, advertising companies who are trying to implement governance and data protection stuff. So not very sexy or exciting, but it paid the bills at times. But the other business that really took off was the core desktop security privacy suite that we had. We were able to take advantage of a shift in the market as broadband came online, where a lot of the new growth in internet users was coming from the kind of mom, dad, grandma, kind of the non-educated or non-sophisticated desktop PC user. And massive explosion in spyware was slowing down their connections. Um, A huge amount of adware, spyware, malware was out there. We had licensed some kind of off-the-shelf generic antivirus malware tech, and we had a pretty nice, simple, we'll protect you, desktop firewall, uh, you know, the privacy protection stuff we had without the encryption, but just the local desktop, uh, you know, e-wallet, protect you, warn you when your information, and, you know, a series of generic antivirus uh, anti-spyware where we really innovated because of our background with ISPs was we understood how important it was for the ISP to help people get these tools and how it could actually drive a lot of revenue and change a cost basis in ISP's channels. So what we did is we built this entire system into the support center for ISPs. So when you called up an ISP and said, hey, my internet's slow, your desktop support agent could say, can I activate a remote scan? He would find malware and say, oh, we found some malware. I cleaned it up. Would you like to, for $5 a month, add permanent protection to your account? The shift kind of was akin to, you know, there was a period in time where people would buy voicemail machines with tapes from Radio Shack. Then all of a sudden, no one did that anymore, and voicemail came from your telco with your phone line for a few dollars a month. We thought something similar would happen with security software, and it turns out we were right. So a lot of these users didn't want to go down to Best Buy or, you know, Fry's or whatever their local computer retailer was and didn't know who Semantic and McAfee were. Mm -hmm. So for them, their trusted provider is AT&T or, you know, Bell South or Bell Canada or whatever your telco is. So when they those people offered them protection, they lapped it up. And so it, it became and it became very profitable for the ISPs because they had this a- extra high margin uh, item that they could add to the monthly billing and they could roll it out to their entire user base. And we provided all the tools for that. We let them white label it. We let them customize it, manage it. Um, so at one point we had integrated with ISPs representing 150 million broadband customers worldwide. So you compare that to what we were doing with Freedom where we had you know 30,000 users after around three, four years. Here, we had access and had distributed to ISPs. And, you know, we were making significant revenue doing that, orders of magnitude higher, and we were just doubling and tripling every year. So it became very, very successful for the company. It just wasn't as ambitious socially or technologically or, you know, the issues I cared about, you know, the kind of civil liberties, privacy, change the world. We fell short on those ideals, but we were able to make money. So as as zero knowledge turned into Cinemos and uh, I guess it was Radial Point is, is a business you were just talking about, right? Um, what happened kind of in between, you know, you pivoting away from the cypherpunk product ideology and then coming back to it to bring Blockstream together? What happened in those kind of in between years? Um, 
Well, a fair amount. You know, life kind of goes on. Uh, in 2007, 2008, I left Radio Point and Sonomos, uh, the companies I had been running and working that entire time with my brother and my father, actually. My father was a businessman, a, you know, kind of a CFO type who had taken companies public. And, you know, he was our first investor in every one of our businesses. And when we started Zero Knowledge, we kind of partnered with him to be our CFO. So it was kind of this hybrid family business, but we ran it with outside investors. And it kind of wasn't run like a family business, but it had family members in it. I stepped away and for a number of reasons. I was burnt out. Personally, I come from a big family of, you know, kind of nine siblings and our youngest sibling had uh, lost a very tough battle to cancer, which just left me heartbroken. You know, a combination of life and just where was my passions? I wanted to get back to stuff that just excited me and drove me. And I just didn't find it in the business that we were in. So I left in 2007 and I started working on the startup community in Montreal. I had seen what had happened in Silicon Valley. I had networked and I had a pretty good network in Silicon Valley because I spent a lot of time out there with Zero Knowledge and I raised money. And at one point we had an office out there. And I just looked at, uh, this was the dawn of kind of Web 2.0. We saw YouTube, we saw you know social networking, we saw Flickr, and we saw how easy it was and cheap it was to start businesses. But that trend had not kind of permeated or made its way to this part of North America yet. And I wanted to be at the ground level of that. So I partnered with some entrepreneurs here I knew. We put together an angel fund. I took another swing at another startup in kind of the gift economy, kind of social, real world gaming space, a project called Akoa, which is a whole nother discussion. It was kind of this pay it forward form of Pokemon Go, if you will. We got people out there with their phones trying to do random acts of kindness, and you would get points and be able to see kind of the karma effect of your random act of kindness as it traveled the world. That was the idea. But yeah, I I kind of was splitting my time between angel investing, running a startup, and building this kind of venture community and uh, startup community. So I hosted a bunch of demo camps, startup camps, and that kind of continued and was my life until around 2010, 11, at which point I just walked away from the entire tech industry. Mm-hmm. I needed a break. I had been doing nothing but startups for 20 years and 20 years of my life. And I just wanted to just travel. I wanted to have a cognitive break from just being inside my inbox every day for hours on, a day, uh, you know, hours upon hours. And so, yeah, I went and traveled. I played some poker. And it wasn't until 2013 that, uh, I kind of came back and, you know, started to really pay attention to a bunch of ex-employees, including Adam, who had been emailing me nonstop saying, hey, we want your attention. We're doing something with Bitcoin. Have you been watching Bitcoin? Pay attention, Austin. Something big is happening. And, you know, I had picked up my head and looked at it a few times. And frankly, my first response was, I'm glad someone figured it out, but I got so many battle scars <laughs> and I'm so uh, cynical I just have no desire to jump back in this because of where my headspace was at at the time. But by 2013, I was actually excited to kind of come back and do something I was passionate about. And uh, Adam and I started talking about what Bitcoin could be. And that was the start of what became Blockstream. And so this was about, so about 2013 was when you first kind of quote unquote got into Bitcoin? Yeah, I would say I went through the, you know, the typical Bitcoin rabbit hole, the latter half of uh, 2013. Adam had come back from uh, the big Bitcoin conference that happened mid-2013 in California, I think it was, either Vegas or California. And a lot of the discussions he was having in the forums with Greg Maxwell, with Peter Woolley, with all the, you know, some of the core devs who he had just been online chatting with, talking about ways to extend Bitcoin, talking about ways to improve Bitcoin. How do, how do you upgrade? How do you add new capacity? How do you change and evolve the system? to deal with things like transaction malleability, you know, all the stuff that ended up becoming part of Blockstream Elements, the open source project, were underway. And there was an idea that a two-way peg was possible. No one actually knew if it was possible. But the idea that you could develop a sidechain was intriguing. And so Adam and I met up in Montreal late 2013, that I flew to Malta where he was living. We hung out for a week in a boardroom 
one day, I think, you know, with his permission, it would be fun to release some of those videotapes because we essentially just mapped out how does the economy of Bitcoin grow? You know, there's going to be processor like Bitcoin, the equivalent of Coinbase in terms of exchanges and or bank financial, you know, plugins. There's going to be wallets. There's going to be, you know, toolkits. There's going to be this. There's going to be that. And we were just kind of asking ourselves, where do we see our the future of what we want to do? Where do we see opportunity? And a lot of our time was spent over how do you build something of significance without being a centralizing force yourself, right? Because so many of the service models or product models, if you go one way, you end up becoming like some of the exchanges can have a huge amount of power. For instance, if you have, a, you know, staking coins or votes. So, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about principles, values, how do we be, be, not become uh, a centralizing or a negative force in the uh, Bitcoin economy? And we basically came up with a rough idea of what Blockstream might do. And uh, then I, I started, we started gathering up or flying in and meeting with some of the core devs, some of the talent to kind of see if they had any interest in joining us. And uh, most of them were so severely underfunded. They had day jobs elsewhere. They saw all the money pouring into Bitcoin, going into companies that were, you know, making some decisions about security and architecture that they didn't agree with, being that they were like either centralizing or just implemented badly. I mean, there were some very large exchanges at the time that were running on like cloud computing and some of the cloud computing platforms couldn't even generate a, a predictable, sorry, an unpredictable random number. There was one online exchange who literally all of their keys that they generated were compromised because they were generating, you know, keys on a cloud computer that had a broken print random number generator. And these guys were just sitting there saying, this is going to destroy the ecosystem if we don't do something. And so, you know, there were a lot of discussions about should we become a consultancy? Should we become a product company? But we focused much more on what was what we felt was scarce in the economy. And that was talent. We said, you know, the expertise to do real low level in the guts kind of Cisco level infrastructure and plumbing is very rare in the Bitcoin industry. And if we get a group of them together and start tinkering, we thought that would be valuable. So it was kind of funny when I saw all the conspiracy theories about Blockstream that we're like, you know, Bilderberg and reptile aliens and <laughs> were designed to, you know, hijack Bitcoin. Our business plan literally was gather smart people and figure out a way to make it pay. It was nothing more than that. And thankfully, because I had some history in fundraising, and because of the caliber of the team, we had some supporters who believed in a free and open Bitcoin and thought that investing in Blockstream was a great way to help support that. The same way Mozilla brought some independence to the internet in the browser wars between Microsoft and Netscape. So I want to talk a little bit about the fundraising aspect because, you know, this sounds like a, a deja vu situation where you're just, you are making essentially a zero knowledge systems 2.0 and somehow you managed to do it again. You managed to raise millions and millions of dollars. Just the seed alone was $21 million, which is cute, by the way. Um, like how, tell me a little bit about the, the, the experience of raising this money again, what maybe you, you did and, and how you were able to get, you know, so much uh, interest in it. So early before the, the company had even done anything. Yeah, I, I mean, there's some stuff I can't go into just because of, uh, you know, confidentiality. But I, I can say in general, I certainly was way more experienced now. I had sat on the side of venture capitalists. I had written checks myself of my own money. Um, I also had, you know, another 10 years worth of relationships in history. So some of the people we ended up raising money with, I had known since, you know, kind of the late 90s, mid 2000. And, you know, some of them had actually turned to me and asked my advice for decisions about their companies in privacy or, you know, certainly having the privilege of having access, uh, history, network, knowledge, it set me up much better than the average entrepreneur just walking into a room and trying to pitch to a bunch of people who they don't know. Also, I think some of them knew that Zero Knowledge was technically very ambitious and didn't hold any failures against me because we're seeing some of the same things that, hey, a lot of the ideas he tried to implement were 10 years ahead of their time. And a lot of the same team that he had then have rejoined him to try and do it new and different now that there is a working eCash system. 
So we certainly had a lot of advantages going into the process. But, you know, at, at the heart of it, you've got to tell a compelling story and you've got to boil things down into very easy messaging. So part of the work I did setting up the entrepreneur community or helping it grow in Montreal was I ran kind of our startup school where I trained over 300 entrepreneurs on how to pitch and raise money. And so it was kind of one of my superpowers was how do you take an idea that may be complex and hard to c convey and turn it into something that is just instantly memorable that an, you know, an investor can go home and speak to their life partner, you know, wife, husband at the end of the evening. And when they say, Hey, how was your day? They probably heard 10 pitches that day. What makes you the one that they say, I saw something so exciting and they're able to say what you do accurately. I saw a company who's going to change the way we detect and cure cancer. I saw a company that's going to change how the future of money works. Um, how do you get that message across? In that respect, I was pretty lucky. Part of it was just timing. By the time we went out to fundraise and we had actually validated that we thought enough of the two-way peg would work, I had commitments from enough of the core devs who ended up joining us, you know, Matt Corello, uh, Peter Woolley, you know, Greg Maxwell, Mark Friedenbach, the whole group of them who ended up joining us. We had a lot going in and the timing was pretty perfect. Because all these companies were raising money, Zappo, the wallet companies, the, you know, the first obvious businesses, exchanges and wallets were getting money from anyone and everyone. Bitcoin had just peaked to $1,200, even though it had come back down. But everyone knew that Bitcoin was still kind of the next best chance or the next big wave of the internet. So there was an outsized demand for big quality Bitcoin deals. And that allowed us to kind of select our investors rather than the other way around. It allowed us to kind of develop a short list of who do we trust and who understands most that we're not building this company to maximize revenue and profit. We're trying to design a company that maximizes social impact and maximizes freedom in Bitcoin. And that was a really hard, you know, selection process because we had to, you know, we literally went through. And the only analogies I can find, and no one does this perfectly, are things like Mozilla, which is a hybrid charity that owns a for-profit company. So I had sat with the founders of Mozilla and participated in a conference talking about organizational design and social mission. What is the best model? Is it you know a class B corporation? Is it a charity that owns a for-profit? Do you create a for-profit with restrictions and governance? And none of them are perfect. So this was a topic I personally was so interested in, which was social entrepreneurship and companies that may change, you know, change their mission statement as opposed to money. And so that was kind of the founding vision for a lot of what we did. And so going into investors and saying, you know what, we're going to need an outsized amount of money because frankly, it may take us four or five years before we figure out exactly which one of these things naturally clicks because we can't build a product or service that ends up be becoming a negative impact inside of Bitcoin. And I can't tell you how many product ideas we came up with that we ended up looking and saying, someone's going to build that. But if we do it because of who we are, we think it actually has a worse effect on Bitcoin. So we would just bypass opportunities that we saw. Yeah. So I, I want to take a moment here to confirm for the audience that you definitely do have a superpower for explaining complicated concepts in ways to interested parties because you have helped me with it um, at times because, you know, in, in the past months we have uh, talked a few times about the startup that I'm working on that I haven't quite announced yet. And one of the things that I've been trying to deal with is just how broad the vision is and how kind of, uh, intricate it is. And then after I, I took the time to kind of explain it to you, I, 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 you, I don't know if you remember, but you, you went on a little like 10 minute rant where you were explaining it back to me. And I was just, my jaw was dropped because of like, I, I just felt like you were on a Ted talk explaining my own company to me. And it was just like, wow. <laughs> and so I, I just want to like compliment you on that and confirm that you're not bullshitting. Like, like obviously the money that you've raised is enough evidence, but just from my own anecdotal, anecdotal experience, you definitely have a special talent for like packaging the these these any any concepts really into something the audience can digest. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, you know, 
It is something that anyone can learn, by the way. It's by no means, you know, a, a superpower that requires you to land in a vat of toxic chemicals to develop. <laughs> um, it, it, but it is, you know, it is something I was kind of conscious about. And I spent some time studying and uh, thinking about and there's, you know, some books and concepts around how do you build mental model maps for people that connect ideas that allow them to overlay something new and exciting into a worldview they already have. And many entrepreneurs, and I found myself in this situation so many times, but I kind of trained myself out of it. They spend so much time in that passion where they're just so, they live in the forest. And when you live in the forest, it's very hard to describe a forest. You always end up describing a clump of trees. It's even harder to describe the landscape upon which the forest is part of, or the state upon which that landscape will exist in five years should the forest not evolve in a certain way. And so taking those abstraction layers and being able to describe at a very meta level, but then also drill down and make it meaningful is something that business operators, they have to learn to do. It was weird for, for it to happen to me because a lot of my background is in marketing and branding. And in, even Adam Back at times has complimented me on like my ability to kind of d convey Bitcoin concepts in layman's terms. But when I had to do it for myself, for my own company, for my own ideas, it's like you kind of lose that ability. It's, it or at least it becomes a lot harder to do it to your own thoughts. And so I, I, I that was like a, a new experience for me to, to have that being my own ideas being said back to me in a way that made even more sense than I had conveyed them. Absolutely. Well, what a funny, just anecdote. So one of the first workshops we would do when we would train entrepreneurs how to pitch their business is we had them make up a fake business that had nothing to do with their own. So I would come in and give them a category like quantified baby. <laughs> you know, if there's all this quantified health stuff. We were like, okay, you're now the CEO of a quantified baby company making a product that allows expecting parents to monitor or improve the health of their pregnancy. We don't care what the product is. You got half an hour to come up with the product and come up with an elevator pitch. Mm -hmm. And you're just allowed to man imagine. And the reason we would do that is because the role playing in someone else's business makes it easier for them to learn the skills without the obstruction of the knowledge that they've accumulated of their own. You just don't want to let go when it's your own idea. Like you just like they're, they're, every detail is important to you and you just don't want to let it go. And you just can't appreciate that the audience just does not care about every de detail as much as you do. Absolutely. And so once they do that with a business that they have no investment in and they learn the skill, it's easier than to translate that back to their business because they're like, hold on, I was able to imagine and pitch an incredible new, you know, smart uh, maternity wear that automatically measures oxygen levels for an expecting mother, I was able to come up with that idea, explain it, pitch it, and, you know, do a really good pitch in a two hour working session. Yet I've been working for two weeks on explaining my own business and I still can't. So you mentioned that, um, you know, there were various products, ideas that were that were either kept or thrown away. And which products, while you were at Blockstream, were the ones that you helped oversee and, and bring to the world? I, I know that you mentioned already side chains, at least, and, and how that, I know that evolved. You've mentioned a few times how you thought a peg was possible. And I, I guess you're just alluding to that. Eventually, liquid and the elements, you know, design ended up not being uh, totally a one-to-one -one peg and having the federated model instead. Maybe talk a little bit about that product and what other products that you oversaw while you were there? Um, so I was CEO for uh, two and a half years, kind of from uh, the beginning of 2014 till mid-2016. This was definitely a group effort. Frankly, a lot of the time I spent fundraising because even though I raised a huge amount of money in the first round, $21 million, I went back and raised another $56 million a lot sooner than we needed to. I won't go into the full details, but sometimes as a CEO... If you see windows of opportunity to raise money closing or shifting, sometimes you want to stock up for a long, uh, a long road and a long battle, you know, while the getting's good and not wait until there's some rough times or rough seas, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of a read of the market led us to believe that this entire blockstream hype that was going on at the time, uh, sorry, blockchain hype was misplaced and going to explode. We were looking frantically because really we believed or had a thesis that if you're going to build any type of blockchain infrastructure, you should start with the Bitcoin code. 
It's the most stress tested. It's the most mature. But it, it didn't do a bunch of fancy esoteric things that, frankly, we thought had no place on a blockchain. You know, that was kind of our operating thesis. Other people like, you know, Ethereum or other platforms chose different ways. They, you know, build a Swiss army knife and it has a purpose in all these different ways because it's a Swiss army knife. So there's different philosophies. We were getting called in to do RFPs with banks, uh, RFPs with everyone and anyone who were trying to do Blockstream projects. And I would say probably 98% of them we looked at and just said, "There, you don't need a blockchain. You know, this is just ridiculous. Why would you ever try and put this on a blockchain? But there were some use cases that we thought could be interesting. Some of them kind of ran counter to sound money. Things like, you know, stablecoin projects by consortiums. Let's say a consortium gets together and says, we want to do a a stablecoin because we want to go after the remittance market. Well, remittance was a big use case for Bitcoin. And because we were Bitcoiners first and foremost, We were kind of sitting there saying, do we really want to help roll up a U.S. dollar uh, remittance network that might prevent people from ever being exposed to Bitcoin? You know, sometimes there were those types of discussions. But, you know, we knew certain things. We just had to move forward. So the open source toolkit elements. I was there when we acquired Green Wallet because we knew we wanted uh, an open source wallet to be able to kind of showcase or integrate some of the technologies and two-way peg and some of the sidechain stuff. Liquid, which was started while I was still CEO and took a lot longer to develop than I think anyone anticipated, which goes to show, by the way, just one of the challenges in bootstrapping or launching all these blockchain projects. I have become such a cynic that any one of these consortium blockchain projects really have a chance. You know, the only way a big consortium led blockchain project happens is when you have one overriding central authority that has all the power that forces everyone to adhere to a new platform and standard. And if you're going to have one big centralizing player who can enforce and dictate and tell everyone run this, do you really need a blockchain? I've thought about that before, how what would actually be the only use case for a blockchain? This goes back to the days that you're talking about. And while I could come up with, and I think we're finally starting to see it, is the only centralized actor that could ever actually make use of a blockchain would be a government in my opinion. Like if a government wanted to issue something or create an environment, like say the SEC wanted to have a blockchain where all, all where they could basically determine all of the rules for what, when you could trade tokenized securities. Well, as long as the SEC was running it, that would allow the people inside of the blockchain to not have to trust each other. And, and, and it wouldn't matter that the SEC had control over the whole entire trading system because all these people were already subject to all of these rules anyway. And so so that that would be, that was the only thing I could ever think of of what what you could actually use a blockchain for, and of course you know people like you or I are never really going to be a lot interested in making platforms for the government. So yeah, I mean we looked at a lot of different models, you know gift certificates, game tokens, collectible assets in virtual worlds, securitized tokens, trading systems, reinsurance contracts, insurance contracts. You know, we actually took money from various captains of industry, if you will, in different industries who, you know, would give us a couple million dollars of a large round. And they just wanted to be able to talk to a blockchain expert. You know, that was their investment interest was, hey, we're trying to figure out this blockchain stuff and we want to be able to call on you to tell us, are we making mistakes or not? And for us, we wanted to learn, is there a real use case? You take money from a strategic investor like Bank ABC, and we were hesitant to, you know, take a lot of money from banks or other players, because, you know, certainly in the Bitcoin world, anytime someone sees you taking money from anyone, you get accused of being a lackey to them or corrupted by them, when in fact, that's just not how investments work. No one had board seats, no one had any influence over our technology. We were just exploring legitimately and honestly, is there a market for these technologies could we build a business? Because we thought if if you develop a cash cow business, it allows you to fund all the other things you do. I'll give you an example. VeriSign spun out of RSA as a certificate authority. VeriSign ended up being a way larger company than RSA's core business at that time because there were more people interested in digital certificates that came as a result of the RSA toolkit than there are developers who want to incorporate and pay for a toolkit. So we didn't know which uh, you know business model, which uh, product line was going to kind of get to scale first, and we were very earnestly looking. So you know, Liquid, we knew 
there was a target, there was a specific use case and user base around, you know, traders, exchanges, people who are trying to accelerate mm -hmm. their Bitcoin trades and, uh, you know, change uh, their risk profile of where they were allocating or storing ca capital. Um, we understood the trade-offs of a fiduciary uh, peg versus a full two-way peg. That was something we felt comfortable and we had a handle with, so we were able to move forward. And we felt it was a good example of a first sidechain that benefited the Bitcoin ecosystem that we felt good about. Um, but even in that, we saw so many of the challenges in how do we make sure that we're not a centralizing authority? Members of this consortium don't want too much power, but you know all the same issues about delegation or separation of trust, risk reduction, all come up. And by and large, it's very hard to see a lot of other use cases that don't fall into the same pattern. There are exceptions. I'm not saying it's a universal rule. I think when we do get more virtual worlds, more open distributed digital goods, there will be some more interesting use cases for blockchain in those environments. By and large, the DeFi stuff and, you know, kind of programmable money you know, the stuff that's happening there. I think, you know, there's excitement and there's experimentation and there's stuff going on, but I did not get into Bitcoin or cypherpunk technologies to build more complex derivative products that ruin more people. That was just never my motivation. I mean, <laughs> this is a big thing for me too, man. Like I, I'm just like so tired of how much of Bitcoin product development has become about finance, has become about trading, has become about custody. And, and I'm just like so sick of it. And, and you know, again, shameless plug. It, it's a big part of why I'm, I'm starting this new company is that I just want to at least be, I want there to be at least one company that focuses on like the Bitcoin stuff that isn't finance, that isn't trading. And so I, I want to I make sure that's true. And I, I mean, I think Blockstream is, is one of those companies, but but they definitely do, you know, cater to finance and, and trading trading use cases, as you mentioned, like with liquid and, and, uh, you know, having the ability for exchanges to use liquid between each other. Um, I, I just think that it'll be more necessary going forward to have things that take advantage of say the lightning network and more app layer products for Bitcoiners to use that aren't about trading. Well, yeah. And I mean, listen, we were one of the first companies to kind of throw resources into developing lightning and we got nothing but grief for it. It's part for the course in the Bitcoin community. You guys got it rough for a while. I, I mean, I, I definitely sympathize. Like the, the whole, I guess it was like 2017 era mostly, but like, you know, the year before that, the year after that, like it was just the Bcash guys that, you know, every troll in, in crypto just wanted to like attack Blockstream. <laughs> we never, ever, ever saw any type of big revenue potential in Lightning. And I, I have yet to see anyone who says you can make tons of money running Lightning nodes. Yet somehow... Lightning was part of a secret plan of ours to hijack Bitcoin, an open source, totally open protocol being developed by three different groups, you know, Lightning Labs, uh, I think, uh, you know, ourselves, and there was one other uh, big group that was doing a lot of code contributions. Uh, the name escapes me, I apologize. We have Async is another one. Yeah, Async. So open source protocol, open source groups for, you know, a, a massive extension capability that, you know, was and is the only right scaling solution. I mean, you and I talked about Bitcoin scaling and kind of the analogy of airplanes, but every single person in the world, or it seemed at the time, just loved to hate on our team and our developers as using this to somehow hijack the entire path of Bitcoin. And for us, it just became like arguing with flat earthers because, you know, it's just at a certain point, the science just does not match up to their crazy, crazy narrative. And the only analogy I could have right now is like QAnon people, unfortunately. <laughs> it's like you got a group of just people who buy into an alternate reality and alternate facts <laughs> and they make you out to be the devil. You know, it just wasn't true. And, you know, so obviously that was added stress and a lot of distraction to anything we tried to do. And, you know, it was stressful on me personally. I think I took it a lot harder than some of our developers uh, certainly, like some of our developers, you know, were just, I think, more used to dealing with trolls and kind of used to ignoring and turning down the noise. But, you know, we did have developers who had health problems. We did have some people I really cared about whose personal lives and fear of their own security started to become an issue. And that that affected me, you know, in a very strong way in the sense that I really got resentful about some of the rhetoric and what it was doing to our company's reputation. And, I, you know, I didn't deal with it always best, to be fair.
I want to talk about a couple of random, you know, Bitcoin and, and crypto topics, but I had one more question left uh, regarding, you know, running Blockstream, which was one thing that was always really cool for me. And, I, and I, maybe I need to confirm it because I didn't go back and check, but I remember it this way. So I think it's true. I recall that it was either the devs or the founders or, or somebody like or everybody in the first, you know, period of Blockstream had some kind of option for locking their their salaries based in BTC rates instead of like dollar or fiat rates. Tell me a little bit about that and how it works and how you designed it, because this is still something I think about to this day. And it's still something that was kind of echoed since then, because, you know, as I've hired people when I worked at BitRefill and when I work, you know, when I might have been recruiting for the new company, um, I still get some people requesting, to, like asking if they could be paid in Bitcoin and have it be a fixed Bitcoin amount. And what's funny is I also want it for myself, too. But when I have it being asked of me, I always I always reply, one, I, I don't think it's the best idea because I worry about like if the Bitcoin price crashes and you need to try to renegotiate and you don't have enough money to live or something. And then two, even right now with the state of my company, I don't have a Bitcoin reserve to put aside for you to make sure that I can pay the Bitcoin in a fixed amount, you know, for two years or three years or however long you're expecting. So it, it's just less convenient as a, as somebody paying out to to not to nominate a salary in Bitcoin. So like, what do you have to say about salaries denominating Bitcoin, and and is that how things like were at, at least at first at Blockstream or maybe still today? I don't know. So I can't speak to the program I oversaw. This was an idea that I came up with and kind of Adam and I kind of loved it, which was, you know, you had stock options, which were well known in Silicon Valley for those people who have been exposed to them. And, you know, stock options, uh, depending on the industry you're in and kind of how good your startup is, are some form of kind of a lottery ticket. But for many startups, it really is a lottery ticket in the sense that I know employees who have spent their entire life, 25, 30 year career going in and out of startups who their stock options have never, ever led to any meaningful cash out. And by meaningful cash out, I mean anything above what an annual bonus might be, right? Mm -hmm. You know, something one X or more of your annual salary value. Um, they've just never seen it. Whereas you see some people, I got a friend who was employee, you know, 30 X at Facebook, you know, he's multi-billionaire. And so, you know, it's very, very different depending on what startup and where, and part of what we hated about that model was it led to kind of the startup roulette where you're just kind of trying to spin again and again and again, where every time two years in, three years in, your startup starts to get tough. Things start to look a little rough. There's, you know, kind of peak of optimism and falling into the, de you know, death spiral of despair that comes in any cycle of a company's uh, evolution. And, you know, you're now understanding the problems, things aren't so rosy, and you're looking around at all your friends who seem to be on the next hot thing with startup options that pay out well. And we just, we didn't like that model. And we didn't want to attract that type of employee. We knew the problems we were working on were going to be long, hard, and uh, exist for, in our case, decades. Because we were talking about financial sovereignty. We were talking about changing the way uh, you know, the money system works globally. And we weren't sure how we were going to do that, but we knew we needed uh, smart, bright people who were mission-first, mercenary-less. Um, so part of our goal was, what if we could incent them, yes, with stock options, but also with some BTC so that their alignment was much more for the success of BTC above and beyond just what, you know, and that's more liquid. So it's more tangible. It's more real. And so that was the inspiration. We said, what if we took some, gave them some stock options, some portion invested BTC. So Bitcoin that we would buy on their start date at lock in at a current market price. And then over the period of their employment, vest the same way stock options vest. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So if they leave the company, you know, they're giving up in some cases a lot. If Bitcoin goes down, well, it may still come back up, but they had this liquid asset that was at least worth an amount locked in at the price. The idea was if over the course of four or five years, Bitcoin's price went up a lot, they could have a significant amount of Bitcoin that was material in the sense that it could be, you know, 1x, 10x, 20x their annual salary to give them a lot of personal financial security. And I'm not going to get into any specifics, but some Bitcoin core devs did very well with their early involvement in Bitcoin. 
just w- what they chose to sell, what they chose to accumulate. Other ones, not that they did badly, but some of them quit their jobs and self-funded all of their passion projects in Bitcoin at a time when Bitcoin was mostly at $80 or $100, right? And for them to even see an $80 Bitcoin price was insane then. They were like, we'll never see it. <laughs> you know, there, there wasn't a universal understanding that Bitcoin at 20000 was even in the realm of possibility. Yet they were willing to sell their Bitcoin just to help move the community forward. So there were some people who came to us who actually had families and had obligations and who were not very cash rich um, because they never cared about that as much as they cared about the mission of Bitcoin. And so this was a way to align everyone's interests. Great idea. I would definitely encourage companies who are thinking about it to think about worst case scenarios as well. That's the one regret I have about the program. Would a worst case scenario be like losing the Bitcoin or that the person gets rich on them when they rest it and they leave? So it's a mix. Um, certainly rest and vest is always a problem. You have that, you know, it's an expression some people may be familiar with is where you, your stock options are worth a fortune and you just decide, hey, worst case scenario, they fire me and I walk away with millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, do I really want to work so hard? And I was less concerned about that. And I don't think... Certainly under my tenure, the time I was there, I did not see that. Our people were still very dedicated, very hardworking. But, you know, there's always ups and downs in a company. And I don't believe that, you know, someone's alliance to a company should be based off their need to draw a salary. So that wasn't really my fear. Like, if you give them financial freedom, then all of a sudden they can quit on you. Um, That shouldn't be a fear you legitimately have. Because if you're not providing them meaningful work where they find success and find a place to move the world in the way they want, then they should probably leave. If they're just staying there for the paycheck, I probably don't want that employee. uh, If that's the only reason. I think there are more moral hazards. So there are tax implications. The way we set it up was we allowed each employee to choose how much risk they wanted to take within a certain bounded area. So you could go to one person and say, hey, I want 40% of my salary weighted against my Bitcoin bond program. Another person could say, hey, I'm not comfortable or I can't take that risk. I've got kids. I've got family. I can only afford 10%. And that's just how we designed the program. Some of the negative side effects of that you see when startups go public. When startups go public, oftentimes you see a huge drop off in productivity and you see everyone just looking at the stock price every day and looking at everyone else in the office trying to guess when what their employee number was versus what yours is. Mm -hmm. And... It does have that effect, even though you you try and overcorrect against that. But when you have kind of a volatile asset that has a meaningful amount of your net worth or your family's net worth associated with it, you start to kind of care. uh, You may care more than you should. uh, And it's hard to just put it away and focus on the long term. Mm -hmm. Stock options, because they're back end loaded, it requires a liquidity event don't have as much that risk, except for when you go public. These are manageable risks. It's just a risk. And you also get people who start to look at the people around them and be like, hey, I'm working four times as hard as this guy, but he joined a year and a half before me. How big is his Bitcoin package compared to mine? Because he got Bitcoin at X price if I go by market value. My Bitcoin I joined when the market was high because you have to price at current pricing. Yeah, yeah. So... You know, there there are ways to implement these programs that are more equitable. Um, but you, you really could have a situation where if someone joined on December 20th, 2013, we weren't set up at that point. Bitcoin was at 1200. Mm-hmm. So their Bitcoin would have been locked in at 1200. Someone joined three months later when Bitcoin was 300. They got Bitcoin at 300 locked in. Yeah, it sounds like it could be solved with a little bit of DCAing instead. Like if you you mentioned percentages, it could be that the Bitcoin doesn't get contributed to their to their stake until the, their their paycheck day. Turns out there's tons of tax reasons you can't do that, and they're all per country, and they're all tied to employment tax. That's the other thing. It became a tax nightmare to administer this. Uh, Depending on when the company held it, when custody was traded to the employee, uh, do they get the tax value? Who appreciates the capital gain? Is it the company who's holding it in trust based off your vesting? Or is it the employee? That was different depending on which country. And we had employees around the world. You also, unfortunately, develop a moral hazard for employers as well, which was a funny one I didn't anticipate. 
But I've seen this with stock options, and I've seen this end up coming up in Bitcoin. But if you have an employee who, let's say, is, I'm not going to say marginal, but like somehow not fitting, and you know, a manager who has a certain budget for hiring, and he sees that this person has a whole bunch of unvested Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, if I fire these two people I hired a year ago, and I get that Bitcoin back into treasury, it's worth so much more, and I could rehire someone new and try someone new. And so all of a sudden, you know, you're kind of incented to rinse and repeat and not be loyal to your people. Ooh, that's a tricky one. Yeah. And you also open yourself up to litigation as well, because if if the employee feels like they were doing a good job sincerely, they're not just going to let you take that Bitcoin opportunity away from them. Turns out laws are very different and they're very employee employer sided. Yeah. So I never oversaw any situation like that. Mm-hmm. In fact, I'm pretty sure I was one of the very first employees to actually ever leave Blockstream. So, you know, I did not oversee a bunch of let go, of lay, layoffs or anything else. But anytime you have conflict, anytime you have people leaving, they look at their stock options, they look at the law, and Bitcoin just didn't have any a lot of legal history around it. Yeah. Right? So there weren't there wasn't a lot of history around tax. There wasn't a lot of history around Bitcoin and employment law. So, you know, it's good to be a pioneer, but sometimes pioneers get shot in the back. And I I can't say I witnessed because I was not at the table at Blockstream, but I, it, it's something that I, I realized afterwards came up, uh, I think would come up and I think is a danger that you've got to figure out some guardrails. You've got to figure out some ways to make sure that uh, a manager who becomes a little bit more curial uh, or a company founder, right? Company founders sometimes can go crazy. And so he's looking at having to fundraise, for instance. Let's say you have a company fa- founder who's set aside a bunch of Bitcoin for employee programs, and he's sitting on effectively what's like a pension plan that he can raid yeah. by firing half of his staff. <laughs> and he's like, okay, I can avoid dilution in a shit market. Bitcoin's up X, X amount. I can literally not have to raise any new capital for another two years by firing half my team and taking their Bitcoin. Well, that would be a good story. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that it hasn't, uh, as far as I know, it hasn't actually happened. But yeah, you, you bring up a lot of good points. I, I guess my my instinct to be uh, averse to providing this to the people asking for it was much smarter than I even I realized. It seems like it, it's a lot of pitfalls there that maybe are best uh, avoided. I still think there are ways to do it. Like there are ways that employers allow uh, top ups on IRA investments. There are histories of em- em- employers allowing employees to buy company stock and giving you matching funds. Um, so whether it's a DCA program that you match employees' DCA contributions or some sort of way, I do think for anyone in the Bitcoin industry, finding a way to help your employees get Bitcoin in their pocket, every employee makes it real and personal to them. So I have no regrets and I'm glad we were pioneers in the area. I wish we had uh, published more about our experience to give more companies guidance on what to do and not to do. Yeah. Well, we have this now um, and the world will get to hear this at some point and, and it's may, it may not be a, a documentation, but it's at least a lot more info than I had about this previously. Um, another side I'm interested in that you're making me think of is, and, and something I've been thinking about lately is how to design this for startups And whether, you know, like if you're a Bitcoin startup, you really are counting on the price going up, that Bitcoin adoption growing, et cetera. And if there are ways to like design deals where like maybe, maybe not your seed, but maybe there's some kind of allocation of Bitcoin that gets unlocked, you know, for your series A or or certain stages where you know that, that that funding is going to be like waiting for you if you achieve a milestone or live a certain amount of time, et cetera. And, And whether or not that would be a better place to be designing, you know, stored Bitcoin into the startup situation. Um, it's a funny one because I mean, any investors who put money into Bitcoin, um, as VCs, I think should, or have had conversations about how much of the treasury corporate treasury should, or can be held in Bitcoin. And the reality is for a lot of companies, not all, but a lot of companies, their cost base is in us dollar or their cost base is in fiat and they're getting funded in fiat for some of the same reasons that we ran into compensation issues. There just aren't, from a legal point of view, 
a, an investor investing in Bitcoin. And there are exceptions. I know there's companies who have taken Bitcoin capital investments. There's companies who have stored a lot of their initial investments in Bitcoin. But it wasn't until the ICO craze, I think, that we saw people getting all of their funding in cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. And there are risks inherent with that. You know, famously, you know, we saw some of the first ICOs who, you know, raised tons of money at, with Bitcoin at a high price who held it all in Bitcoin. And that's just cash management. I don't know where I come on this. I would hate to go to a bunch of my staff and say, we're doing a round of layoffs because we kept most of the company's balance sheet in Bitcoin and we were on the wrong side of that. Yeah, I, I agree with you on the balance sheet stuff. Like I'm thinking more about designing like long-term deals for, you know, fundraising for the company itself. In other words, like, you know, say you're getting your initial funding, you know, for your seeding of your company and then you you make part of the deal that part of the condition of uh, them getting a certain percentage of equity is that they will guaranteed fund your next round of raise and they would set aside the Bitcoin por or a portion of the Bitcoin of it now. And that no matter how much the Bitcoin went up, that it would still be part of that raise. Like they would, that's what that would be their participation. I think a broader discussion, there, there are a whole bunch of venture reasons why some of that stuff doesn't make sense. You know, VCs love optionality Yeah, because, you know, it's like poker. It's, you don't want to ever commit to go all in on the river before you've seen the turn card, right? If you play poker for that analogy, like you want as an investor to be investing in deploying capital with the latest information possible and you want to price that with the latest. So committing to spending that capital today and locking up that capital becomes a burden. And so uh, I think there are some interesting things that are possible but they don't exactly accomplish what you're talking about in terms of negating the, the ability to price at the market rate any new fundraising rounds. And also for the entrepreneur to a certain degree, because the entrepreneur wants to take full advantage of any growth or progress they've made to reduce dilution. Yeah. Because anytime an investor says, hey, I committed, you were only worth 10 million pre, and I committed... $3 million in uh, fiat mm -hmm. and another $2 million in Bitcoin. But I committed. I locked it up. And your $3 million in fiat, great. I got X percent of the company and my $2 million in Bitcoin. But by the time you took the Bitcoin, it was now worth $25 million. So do I get two-thirds of your company? Because my investment is now two, you know, $25 million into a $10 million company. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm trying to design this from the state of, you know, the company getting the, all of the upside. And I guess that, that, that would never realistically, it would be unlikely to realistically play out in a fair way that, that would make people happy. So I see what you're trying to say. I was just trying to think out loud as far as ways that, you know, you could make it. I just, I hate the idea of, of a founder having to spend a lot of time fundraising if that's not like what their strength is or their interest is, you know? So I, I just, I, I think about these things sometimes about like, oh, how could I, how could I design this so I don't have to ever fundraise again, you know? I, I, trust me, I know it's such, I mean, listen, I'm fundraising for a new company now, not my own, but a company I'm an angel investor and I'm helping this is in, you know, genetic health, a totally different industry dealing with, you know, people with Crohn's disease and IBS. And every time I get, you know, help a company through it, I realize just how much work goes into it. But there is a gating function that is actually, I think, healthy for a market. And I think we saw the downsides of that in the ICO craze, because when capital is free and easy, it has two disastrous consequences. One, the shit that gets funded is shit. And it's a huge distraction to market pricing and market indicators when you have a bunch of overvalued shit that can't be distinguished from the Shinola. Um, and we saw that, you know, ICOs raising money from dumb money investors on everything from straight out scam to total hopeful idiots who are writing about ambitious plans that were just not based in science or reality. So, you know, the stargazer who says, I'm going to build a cold fusion spaceship because he read so-and-so sci-fi novel and decides he wants to go to space like Elon Musk shouldn't get $200 million based off writing a white paper. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there should be a gating function that says, I'm sorry, if you don't show to qualified investors, and not all VCs are qualified, not all professional investors are qualified, but with no bar at all where you're able to raise money uh, completely 
easily with no barriers. We do end up having mispriced, and that draws away talent. That invites more regulatory oversight, as we've seen. It uh, leads to more scams and criminals entering the market. I've been very on the record and very, and I think you've uh, as well expressed concern with a, a huge amount of this ICO problems. That's not to say that there aren't improvements that should be made in the capital raising process. Yeah. But I don't think removing the barrier is a good thing. You know, if we say that the only qualifications for getting into the Olympics is sign a letter saying why you love the Olympics, the Olympics is kind of going to become meaningless. Yeah, you always want all sides, I guess, to be happy and healthy and, and any amount of overweight on, on any aspect of funding or lack of funding is, is, is a sign of unhealthiness, even if it is overfunding. It, it causes all the things you just mentioned. I mean, in today's world, I, we've never had the level of information uh, parity that we have today in the investor's world. If anything, it's weighted much more on in, uh, entrepreneurs raising money. Back when I started... VCs were this like total black box. You had no idea how to penetrate. There was no information out there about how VCs made decisions. It was just this witchcraft thing. Someone goes to Silicon Valley and you read about them raising money. And if you were part of the inside club and part of the group that got tapped on the shoulder at Stanford because you were part of the you know kind of group, or if you had a connection into it, then you kind of learned or got to know because you you would get a mentor. And I thankfully was, even though I was Canadian and coming from outside, I was able to learn. I was able to have some great mentors. Um, and But it took a lot of time and money. Now, someone can spend, you know, between all the courses, blog posts, uh, examples of slide decks, uh, you know, and the amount of money chasing good quality entrepreneurs I would say, if anything, it's weighted for the entrepreneur. Like they have more options for fundraising than ever before. That's probably true, and I, and I wish I had known that. Well, maybe I don't because I'm, I'm I'm happy with my situation now. But you know, I was pretty unhappy with my situation when I was doing my first uh, self-funded Bitcoin startup, and that was when I was doing the video streaming platform. And you know, it didn't work out for various reasons, and I won't bore the audience with that in this podcast. But you know, the main thing that, that ended up happening was I didn't want to spend any more money on it. I had spent most of my money and I, and I didn't want to spend more. And I was faced with whether, deciding whether to fundraise or try and get a job. I ended up getting a job at BitRefill and I ended up helping BitRefill with fundraising, pitch decks, et cetera. And I actually helped people with pitch decks a lot before, but I was only really superficially exposed until I was at BitRefill. And at BitRefill was when I finally got to see more firsthand like, talking to investors and sitting in meetings with them and things like this. And, and now with this new company as well. And I wish I had known when I was doing the streaming platform how much money there really was out there chasing because even if I had just raised $100,000, it just would have changed everything for me for, for that project. Um, like I said, I'm happy with where I am now and I, I wouldn't necessarily go back and change it. But with how I felt back then, I, wish, I do wish I had known. Like, I would have felt a lot better that knowing that that was actually a really feasible option that wouldn't be so impossible as I thought it might have been. Yeah, it's kind of a funny irony that, you know, we, especially in the Bitcoin world, we are so tuned to the idea of, you know, making money scarce because the entire, you know, idea is, you know, you should have to be good quality money. It should be scarce. And we talk all the time about the, you know, never ending money printing machine, printing machine go burr of fiat currency, but we don't deeply appreciate just how much money there is out there. I mean, there's just tons and tons of money and it's all desperately looking for a home. And so I believe capital is actually one of the most abundant things on the planet. Uh, and that's both good and bad. I mean, if you're an entrepreneur looking to start a business, you there is abundant capital if you know how to communicate and you know who to speak with. If you're looking at it from the point of society's role in consumption, overuse of resources, uh, growing you know, uh, income and financial inequality in the world, the effect of all of those things on kind of what happens in the singularity when we have technologies of mass destruction and you know, massive inequalities, it's a really horrible situation that I'm, you know, we need to correct quickly. And you know, current monetary policy is not getting us there. It's worsening the problem. So 
it's this weird dichotomy where the abundance of capital can be great for funding solutions, but the solutions, if they're not directed in the right ways, are actually making some of these problems worse. I wanted to talk to you a little bit. You had mentioned, you know, you started talking about, you know, how blockstream was being attacked by by trolls and things like this. And I wanted to kind of go back and circle to the Segwit2x kind of era and UASF and all of this time. And uh, you had mentioned the uh, the airplane uh, analogy and in story, but you didn't take the time to talk about it. So I, I thought that that was a really cool story, and it leads to another thing I wanted to bring up. So can you maybe tell the audience what what, what you were talking about with the airplane meme? Sure. Uh, before I left Blockstream, I was preparing a talk that I ended up not giving, and it was talking about the scaling debate. So this would have been kind of April, May, uh, June, two thousand sixteen timeframe. So before the full kind of 2x uh, proposals came, but when Gavin and kind of all of, this is like a couple of months after Fake Toshi came out and the scaling debate was still very hard. And uh, one of the kind of most vocal people was obviously Roger Ver, but there was a whole group of kind of people advocating for splitting Bitcoin. And there was Bitcoin XT. This is kind of that era. Uh, A lot of debate around censorship. Uh, and us being accused of leading the censorship in the industry, which was another ridiculous claim. Um, and I started to describe the situation to friends and people who asked me, where should I be on this scaling debate as kind of a cargo cult plane syndrome. And for people not familiar with cargo cults, it's this kind of phenomenon in cu- cultural anthropology that's a real you know, fact. Is, you know, following World War II, when the U.S. military had set up forward operating bases to refuel planes, they set them up in all these uh, islands throughout the Asian kind of peninsula and kind of all the uh, Polynesia and that part of the world. And many of these islands had native populations who had never seen machines, never seen white people. Um, And all of a sudden, the US military is there with refueling stations, setting up, you know, airplanes, flying in, landing, flying off. Oftentimes, as one of the ways they kind of did a hat tip to the native population is they drop off a cargo container full of gifts. So this was their way of saying, we're sorry, we're invading your space. Here are some gifts. And I studied the phenomenon in gift culture when I was doing some work in gift economies. And what was fascinating is they went back 30 and 40 years later after the military had won the war, picked up their bases and left. And they found these native populations were mimicking and had turned this into a religious ceremony where they would mimic the activities of, sol- of the soldiers. They'd march up and down. They would make out of uh, like plant and tree pretend airplanes. And they were trying to mimic the ceremony of planes landing and soldiers marching to try and get the cargo container to come back. They were trying to recreate this magic cargo container from the sky. And it's a phenomenon known as cargo cults. And what oftentimes it's referred to, Richard Feynman used it to talk to, about science where you have a group of people who base all of their knowledge off the real knowledge of other people with a whole bunch of assumptions. They never learn enough to know how something actually works. They just pretend they know how something works. And I thought it was so just bang on accurate for how we saw the Bitcoin scaling debate go on. And the example I would use, and I gave you this kind of story, is imagine we have discovered airplanes. You know, the Wright brothers, there's a group of people And there are a group of engineers who have built the only live operating plane. And it's super popular. And there's a gentleman who owns the domain name airplane.com and Expedia.com and airplanetickets.com. And he loves airplanes. And he's funneling a bunch of business and a bunch of sales to the airplane company. And he says, guys, I've got so much demand. I really want you to increase the number of flights. Increase the number of people on flights. They said, we can fly this many times a day. That's it. We can fly once every 10 minutes. That's it. That's the only amount of time we can fly. Um, So so just add more seats to the plane, please. Can you strap on more seats? I understand economics. I can drop the cost of a plane ticket by adding more passengers to the plane. And the engineers say, I'm sorry, sir, that's not safe. We're concerned about the industry of airplanes. If we're overweight, if we are unsafe, and if we have a disaster, it'll destroy the industry. This person basically says, you don't understand airplanes. 
And the engineers are like, you don't understand airplanes. And you have this kind of argument back and forth where someone says, I understand airplanes better because I understand economics and airplanes are all about air co- economics. And so you will please add a whole bunch of chairs that I'm going to strap to the wings. And a bunch of other people say, I- I'm sorry, that is not safe. That is just not safe. And we don't recognize your opinion to tell us how to build Bitcoin safely or an airplane safely. And this became the kind of status of the debate where you had a whole bunch of people. And listen, I include myself in this. I sat down with our core devs and literally tried at the time to say, guys, why not 2X or 4X or 8X? I had seen proposals for 248. Once I fully understood everything that went into their decision, and I understood why the trade-offs, the fact that you know even the exchanges at the time who had done no work on their... Uh, you know, batching, no work on how they use the blockchain, who are being wasteful in all of their engineering efforts. This can't be something that is so heavily weighted on let's ask the core dev to just switch a setting because it becomes technical debt that we inherit and it becomes the scaling method and it's not sustainable and it's going to actually destroy this thing we all love. And so once I understood what went into it, I knew that their decision was principled, not that I had any power either. And that was my other frustration, because in our contracts, we specifically wrote that Blockstream was forbidden from overriding, from representing their opinions in the open source community. And we actually had a moral clause, a morality clause that allowed each of them to resign, publicly state that we were acting immoral, and we had to pay them to continue to work on Bitcoin. So even if I wanted to force them to do something they didn't believe was right, But somehow the entire industry believed that Blockstream was corrupting them to do something that was to our financial advantage when nothing could be further from the truth. I went to them and said, it's so easy for us just to go along with the industry. Why don't we just change the setting? I listened to qualified engineers who knew the science, who made a qualified, legitimate, intellectual argument for why scientifically this was bad. And I had been used to dealing with cryptographers and engineers and looking at trade-offs. And for me, it became obvious. So that's why we, in our mind, supported what they did, but it was their decision. And I stand by their decision. And I think the industry has come along and uh, learned to understand it. But you know, the way that was politicized and the toxicity, I mean, there was at one point, you know, monetary bounties put on some of the core devs to uh, have them assassinated or attacked. It brought out some of the worst parts of the industry and it was very unfortunate. And because I think the communication and some of the techniques that came out of that, I'm very glad that the principled engineering point of view was upheld and that that is what where the industry, because I do think showing that users had the, the ability with nodes, with uh, user-activated software was a very important day for the industry to show that companies do not dictate. And it's so important for the future of Bitcoin. But I worry that some of the techniques that were used to develop that are, are, are techniques that have taken hold as uh, you know the normal practice. You know, the same way in a democracy when some of the techniques of you know, shaming your enemy or, you know, destroying your enemy or name calling or some of the techniques of populist dictators gets to be the norm of how you win. Even if you, you know, get a good new, newly elected leader in power, you have to wonder, are we going to be living with these techniques for the rest of our lives once people know that they are the norm? So the TLDR is, you know, in, in RBTC after this, this, this pod- podcast is published, we're going to see, you know, Blockstream Austin Hill says Bcash is a cargo cult, right? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. The thing that's amazing, and I mean, this just goes to show is I saw a presentation. I kind of stepped away from the Bitcoin world actively, but I, I ended up attending a, co- a, a Bitcoin conference and maybe a year ago, year and a half ago, a bit more than that, actually, um, where I saw Roger giving a presentation. And the presentation just, you know, a full third of it was just lies about Blockstream, still obsessed about why, blo- you know, Blockstream is corrupting and destroying and making transaction fees high. And, you know, when your narrative is all about an enemy and it's all based off kind of, frankly, lies, it just, it doesn't have sustainable power. And so we see this in our BTC, BCH. It's really like, guys, you forked off. Enjoy your fork. 
fork you, fork day, <laughs> you know, and, and talk about yourselves. Talk about everything you're doing for users. Don't tie your entire life around something that happened three, four years ago that was a voluntary disassociation. You chose to leave. We think that's healthier for this community because we don't have to have you here. If you don't like what you're building, then build something else. And that's what we see. We see them forking again. Yeah. And none of them have solved the inherent problem that they accused us of, which was developer funding. How do you fund developers? We chose raise money from private investors who have so much money that they can fund non-profit driven enterprises. Even though Bitcoin, Blockstream is a for-profit, we raised money from investors who don't mind throwing 10 million or 5 million or 20 million or whatever the number is to a company that has more social goals at its heart than pure profit. These are the same people who fund Mozilla or Internet Archive or other you know, charitable or hybrid organizations. That's the way we chose it. We chose not to try and change Bitcoin to include a block reward so core developers could get paid. We didn't think that was healthy. And we provided some funding. But what's better and I'm most proud about is I think it made the industry recognize the importance of funding core devs. And now you see so many more organizations funding de core developers, funding open source. And uh, in fact, Blockstream has, you know, is minuscule in terms of its contribution, especially now that Peter is over at uh, you know Chain Code Labs, and I think that's actually healthy for the industry. Yeah, it's it's a big part of the culture now where we're seeing you know a lot of value put in and a lot of respect given to those that are that are willing to fund open source development for Bitcoin core developers, etc. Um, you know as much as anyone that I was a you know a, a big uh, proponent in in fighting you know for these kinds of things that you were just talking about with keeping Bitcoin from forking and making making sure it was scalable. You know, not putting more seats on the plane in an unsafe way. But you know, I think you also know that. I am somebody that has a lot of trouble having a good relationship with core developers. And, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about that because I've joked that like one of my, like I want to be the Roger Ver of Bitcoin. And, <laughs> and what I mean by that is like, I think that like Roger Ver has good intentions, but he has bad morals and he has bad understanding of Bitcoin. And so he does like all the wrong things, even though he has, even though he has some like rationale behind what he actually wants to happen sometimes. And so I, I, I sometimes find myself feeling like Roger Ver when I'm on the other side of ire from a core developer, because I'm not say fitting the proper culture of how to talk inside of GitHub, you know, the way they expect me to in a PR or, you know, I'm, I'm viewing things from the way of seeing core developers as, uh, making sure we see them as as enemies first or attackers because we have to be careful who we trust with, with updating and editing Bitcoin code and trusting that code because most people that use it aren't really qualified to audit this code. And we, we're working on, you know, a system of trust and, and waiting for the market to see if, you know, code is safe and people's reputations are worth trusting and all these things. So we, we put a lot of trust in a lot. And I think that like that, while we do all have a tremendous amount of respect and appreciation for what core developers provide, there is some kind of cultural divide. And I'm bringing all this up because, you know, you are one of the people, probably the only person that actually helped me see how, um, even if I'm right, even if my behavior is, you know, justified and their behavior is inferior, that 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 doesn't matter sometimes because people are, are just the way they are. And what the real skill is and what the real value is, is trying to figure out ways to bring people together to do things together to, you know, have overall progress and benevolence for Bitcoin and for humanity. And so it's something I think about a lot since since you had that talk with me. I don't know, this is maybe two or three months ago now. But, uh, you know, I, I haven't necessarily stopped triggering core developers, but I have started thinking more about, you know, is there is there something here, you know, in this in, in a situation where I can try to, you know, make progress instead of making it just about like proving a point? And so I, I do I am definitely more selective and I do try to definitely make it more about teaching moments for the people that actually do care about what I have to say than about getting on a soapbox or, or grandstanding, you know? 
Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And I'm glad to hear that uh, our conversation had uh, some effect and that you're more conscious of it. I mean, partially, I I think, A, I'm more sensitive to this. um, And I think I told you some of the reasons. I saw firsthand the pressure and the weight that a lot of core devs carry on their shoulder. And I saw kind of the daily abuse that they earned in many respects for that and from that. And yes, sometimes, you know, I would see them be their worst enemies in there, whether it's, you know, hanging out in Reddit too much or getting into debates. But when I would actually sit down and talk to them, I was surprised at how often my understanding of issues was shallow and that they actually could justify or had a very good, you know, at least a very well thought out and very moral stance. I mean, I think I related to you. One of my best moments at Blockstream was I was in with, you know, a professor at one of the top universities, one of the heroes of cryptography who has invented more crypto than we've ever used, (laughs) or maybe an exaggeration, but certainly someone whose uh, work we all depend on. And I was with Adam and with some other members of our team. And I literally saw, you know, just genius. It was like, you know, almost the kind of beautiful mind moment of people working at the chalkboard and mapping out these algorithms and going back and forth. And, you know, I felt like I was witnessing, you know, Feynman and Oppenheimer and a bunch of people at the Manhattan Project literally talking about creating the future. And the end part of that conversation was them attacking their own work. They were talking about changes in algorithms. And I am thankfully enough conversant and have spent enough time with cryptographers that I could follow. I don't understand any of the thing in practice. But I literally saw them then t- attack their own work and say, if we were to introduce this in the next five years or 10 years, is that ethical? Would you trust your entire net worth? Would you trust the future of finance, uh, the future of Bitcoin on this? Because if we're wrong, it could be a critical risk. And so that kind of stress testing, that type of a risk-based mentality to development, to the, you know, not everyone subscribes to that, by the way. Most ICOs, many other projects are hit, ship whatever's new. And they're all about what's the latest, greatest, coolest, newest thing. And that kind of thinking usually leads to massive exploits, uh, DeFi hacks, cryptography that's roll your own. I mean, a whole bunch of bad examples that have affected the industry. It took a certain level of integrity as engineers to say, we go with what's conservative, we go with what's stress tested, we go with what's known, and we're doing it for moral reasons that weigh on us very heavily. And I saw them carry that weight. And at times, you know, just self-admittedly, I added to that weight, just being a bad manager or not doing my job well. And so, you know, all things being equal, I will always side with core devs if I can, even at times when they would frustrate me. And there were many times I would be frustrated, but I always found that if I tried to understand what was causing them to act a certain way or where the friction was, I ended up learning way more than uh, I could teach them. Because, you know, just surprisingly incredible minds who are in so many ways uh, have thought through an issue eight moves ahead of anything I could come up with. But, you know, like you go try and do something you're an expert in. You know, there were times where I would try and bring my expertise in marketing to bear. And I was told that I didn't know what I was talking about. And so, you know, there wasn't this kind of mutual level of respect. Like I'll respect your capabilities in crypto, Will you please respect what I'm good at in marketing? Right. And that's when you start feeling like Roger Ver, right? Because he's trying to say he understands economics and they don't. And they're trying to say he doesn't, he doesn't understand cryptography. So it gets really tricky, you know? Well, and this is where the conversation goes past each other. Yeah. I don't want to focus too much on Roger per se, but the reason I never engaged with Roger, like I just refused to sit and meet with him uh, at the end of the day, was because I saw time and time again, people sit with him, including Adam Back, including others, And him just be 100% dishonest. He would sit with you over dinner, uh, say one thing entirely, be semi-friendly, and then in a public forum, turn that conversation around, misrepresent it, lie, uh, you know, just push a narrative that was entirely based off winning the war and had no rules of engagement in terms of intellectual honesty. And I've just seen it enough. But to try and equate... I understand economics of how to sell airplane tickets with I know how to fly and land a and design a safe airplane 
is not intellectually equivalent. Right. You can't make the leap. You have to have your battle on the right battlefield. That's right. And it's not, it's not proper to battle economics on a cryptographic battlefield. And that is increasingly tough in Bitcoin because these, there's game theory dynamics, there's economics. Bitcoin is not one thing, as we all who have gone down the rabbit hole and love and breathe and you know, enjoy the incredible richness of this ecosystem experience. You can come at Bitcoin from so many different ways. But I have never, ever, ever found a core developer who couldn't stand toe-to-toe on the economics. So to inherently act like they don't understand economics because you don't understand safe engineering is an intellectually dishonest position. Because you're dealing with someone who does understand economics and has thought about it, studied it, and understands security engineering and risk trade-offs and has a very, very valid point. And that was one of my frustrations that was lost. But like I said, I, I think it was healthy for the community to go through. It was incredibly painful. And I'm just, you know, I look forward to a day when all those people can stop making their entire life and their entire raison d'etre, their entire, you know, kind of spirit of community and core around hating us or hating Blockstream or hating the, the, you know, the other guys who are somehow this mysterious boogeyman who corrupted the entire ecosystem back in 2016 uh, as their only reason for being, you know, it's like, find a new life. Yeah, well, you know, maybe you're in luck or maybe they're in luck because now we have Square Crypto. <laughs> and, you know, Square Crypto has funded, I think, you know, 22 or so developers for six to 12 month grants. And they're, you know, have all kinds of projects they've spun up and maybe they'll, they'll start attacking them. Instead. Well, that's not the lesson I want. <laughs> Obviously, because <laughs> I love what Jack's doing and I'm a big fan of Square Crypto. And, uh, you know, and by the way, I mean, even back when we were Blockstream, we literally advocated so many of these companies that would come in and yell about the direction of bitcoin we would just say listen it's an open source project show up yeah if you don't like it find a way to be represented you can't complain and not show up and vote it's like you know you bitch for eight years about not winning the lottery but you never buy a ticket come on get involved yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I have some criticisms about having major companies fund so many, you know, developers and but these are all just like kind of me nitpicking. Like in the end, it's a lot of money going towards Bitcoin improvement. And it's true, even in the case of Square or any of these other like exchanges are starting to fund core developers and things like this. Like if you don't like what they're doing, you have to find some way to influence them, to have a voice with them or to compete with them and fund things yourself. Yeah, I mean, listen, the guys at Chain Code Labs I think kind of set the example and I think they're underappreciated in the sense that they showed up and just started contributing. Thankfully, they had a background or resources, you know, being ex-MIT and, you know, having experience and some financial resources that they could just say, we love this. So we're going to learn to code and contribute. And they went through a learning curve, but they did it. They got over the hump. They started to become very valuable and respected contributors to the project. And then they said, now we're going to teach others what we learned. And they set up the school, they set up Chenko Labs, summer programs, and they've now spread that on and spread that word and increased their ability to contribute. And I think it's a great model. But, you know, once again, this is a company that's not out there selling a product. It's self-funded. So every company has to figure out why or how they want to contribute. Blockstream had its, you know, we had benefactors and investors, and we made it a core part of our mission that we will always dedicate some of our resources to the open source project. and. We had investor support for that. I don't think enough companies originally ever included that discussion with their investors. It was all about, you know, how many people can I get to run my wallet? How many people can I sign up at my exchange? And they took for granted the plumbing and infrastructure that they relied on. And then when it didn't do what they wanted to, they screamed and yelled and looked for easy answers. Do you have any thoughts about the current trend of these public companies that are now taking positions in Bitcoin, like how MicroStrategies uh, invested the 450 million and Square was 50 million, and there have been some others that have that have been announcing? You have any thoughts on that? I definitely think it's incredible. It's great for a number of reasons. One, if we truly believe that Bitcoin is what we believe it is, which is you know monetary freedom and sound money 
And it's hard to argue with that with just never ending money printing and the acceleration of massive deficits and all the economic sides, which there are better people than me to explain. But I think everyone in the Bitcoin knows kind of that argument, then absolutely, it should be every CEO's responsibility to think, am I protecting my treasury from deflation? And there's two ways to do that. You go out and spend more, you raise more debt and you spend more to grow your company's assets by buying cheap assets, or you protect your assets from being essentially watered down due to the economic environment uh, that surrounds US dollar or fiat. And so the fact that Bitcoin is becoming part of those strategies, I think is great. You already have large multinationals who invest into currency baskets or you know do hedging strategies to reduce currency risk. And I think it's just never before has the US dollar been seen as a currency risk. So that's exciting. I do think that as Bitcoin becomes popularized and seen as a hedging asset or an a- asset that sits alongside with parity of gold, of other safe assets, which we're still just at the earliest stages of, uh, you know, a few strong tech believers is nothing in the grand scheme of things. But I think that's very exciting. Having more treasuries who hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet, I think is a good thing. Yeah, so I'm generally very supportive and positive of it. I also think it broadens out the kind of base of holders to some people who aren't as prone to maybe day trade or take advantage of short squeezes. And all of that is good. You know, as we broaden the investor base for people who are long term asset holders who are thinking about it over, you know, multi year, multi decade uh, deflationary cycles and inflationary cycles, in fact. They're thinking about holding it as an asset in those terms and less about how often I trade it, I think also benefits the industry to add more stability. Because as much as I'd love to see Bitcoin jump to 40,000 tomorrow, I know it's bad for Bitcoin. I think you know gradual, long-term growth is actually much better for the industry because you know that volatility, as we've seen, creates kind of the inverse or adverse effect of having the downside volatility drive a bunch of people away and run around and claim, why would you ever want an asset, own an asset that goes from, you know, 18,000 to 3,000? Well, we're about wrapping up with my question. So I just have a few miscellaneous ones that I want to get to. My first question in this little section is, are you going to come back? Are you going to, you know, get back into either the ring with a, with a startup, and, you know, related to privacy, cryptography, uh, Bitcoin, anything like this? Do you have anything going on in this arena or is it something you just kind of want to stay away from permanently? Um, I never say permanent, um, but I'm enjoying time away. Not that I'm, you know, retired. I still talk to a lot of Bitcoin entrepreneurs. I do some coaching on fundraising for some of them. Uh, you know, we've had a few discussions. There's a few other businesses that I really like that I think the ecosystem is missing. So, you know, those who are in the know and those who I kind of build, you know, some appreciation. And, you know, most of that I just do volunteer because I like the industry and I'm a big fan of entrepreneurs. The, the business of Bitcoin is less exciting to me these days. I don't think there are big multi-billion dollar business opportunities And I think most of the growth in this next phase of Bitcoin is going to be institutional Wall Street, helping normalize for family offices, doing the custodial issues, all important building blocks. But the same way with zero knowledge, it can be very profitable and help the industry and help it grow. But it's just not where my passions lie. Like I'm interested in kind of a little bit more, you know, man of La Mancha, fight a windmill, find some grand evil wrong that you can wail against. Uh, and I think Bitcoin has cast that die. It's already done that. And it still needs a lot of nurturing and it needs the hard work of everyone working in it. I just don't know if my role is still there as an investor or an entrepreneur. So yeah, I've been enjoying my time, you know, enjoying pandemic times in a new Latin American country I moved to. That, and I'm working on some other issues I think are equally, if not more important than just monetary freedom. Not to criticize anyone because everyone deserves to have their focus in life. But I have found that when you go into a Bitcoin rabbit hole, you know, kind of the meme, Bitcoin solves this, becomes a little bit your mindset where the solution to every problem is Bitcoin. And in fact, the world has big, big problems that Bitcoin has nothing to do with the solution or very cursory. Yeah. So one of the big ones I'm spending time thinking about is uh, 
something known as kind of the vulnerable world thesis, which I alluded to earlier, which is what happens when we have technologies of mass destruction, whether it's synthetic biology, nanotech, um, technologies that can have an outsized impact on the future of humanity or the planet, or could cause a mass extinction event, or cause society to move into a dystopian totalitarian uh, reaction, either from a terrorist attack or from someone abusing the tech. What happens when those are widespread, widely available, and you have an environment of anger, social strife, inequality that's pervasive in the world? There's a whole bunch of Nick Bostrom has kind of talked about this as one of the biggest threats. And I think for the next 20 years, it is the single largest threat to the future of life on this planet. And so I'm spending some time with scientists and advisors thinking about different ways to attack that problem. Don't tell me you're one of these guys that thinks that, you know, AI, AI is going to take all the jobs and UBI is the only solution. Uh, no, that's not. <laughs> there will always be jobs, but I do believe that there is definitely going to be a massive shift in employment driven by AI uh, faster than most people recognize. I believe our economies are entirely inequipped to deal with it. And uh, deficit spending as a model whether it's for UBI, whether it's for social assistance programs, is a short-term solution that once you get hooked on, ends in disaster. But it's one of the only ones they have in their arsenal right now. And we're seeing that in pandemic times. They ramp up subsidy spending and uh, you know giving money to people because they have no other good options. And so in this, I would probably subscribe a little more with Jeff Booth's concepts mm -hmm. around his book, The Price of Tomorrow, where... I think we need to figure out a ways to accelerate abundance and accelerate deflationary economics. So you're saying Bitcoin fixes this? Uh, that is one part of the solution, <laughs> but it's not the only one. Yeah. I mean, Bitcoin is not going to solve an upset, radicalized 15-year-old who goes and builds something in his garage using CRISPR that makes an AR-15 look like a pop gun when he goes out and kills 5 million people. And we see society's reaction to that. And currently, all the solutions to that problem are let's deploy mass surveillance and have everyone surveyed all the time so we can catch it before it happens. And that's the only solution people are offering. And I just hate that solution. So I really am interested in expanding the solution space around how do we get better solutions to avoid this kind of disastrous misuse of technology. Yeah, it seems like kind of a super abstract problem to be focusing on. So I, I can kind of see the appeal because it could have its own rabbit holes and such. Um, it's not really one that, I, that I'm going to focus on anytime soon because I'm still lost in the Bitcoin rabbit hole. I, I don't think it fixes everything necessarily, but I do think that like it would make so everything so much easier to think about if if the Bitcoin promise were in place, you know. And so that's why I joked about saying Bitcoin fixes this with with the Jeff Booth example you gave. Is that you know I, I feel like if the deflationary money was in place, it would allow society to just blow all of the, the suds off the top of the drink, you know, and, and make it easier to see what was actually in the glass, you know, whether it was half full or what was going on. So we could then see what we're dealing with. And I think that this concept of abundance and, and trying to get to that point of a deflationary society, I do believe in that. And I do think that's kind of a next level way for Bitcoiners to start thinking that it's not just about the money. It's not just about getting rich and number going up, but there are actual like cultural and societal benefits to having a proper system in place that would allow us to start solving uh, problems more civilly and more, you know, cooperatively. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, part of this is also just on timelines. Yeah. It would be good if like, it, everything really, really slowed down when you think about like, you know, an AI uh, paradigm shift, but uh, and then also you kind of want things to speed up when you think about like Bitcoin, you know, fixing things. Yeah. And I mean, this is one of the things that fascinates me about some of this work is you know, depending on the order and the pace of some of these technological evolutions, um, you know, right now, what's getting the most amount of investment and money is surveillance tech and surveillance capitalism and tools and technologies of mass data gathering. And there is no counterpoint to an investment in technologies of freedom or technologies of privacy protection or technologies that improve individual autonomy. Anyway, it's a fascinating topic that I'm enjoying spending some intellectual uh, cycles on while I still am front row in the cheerleading seat of the entire Bitcoin industry, but not necessarily on the playing field.
Yeah. Um, another question I had was, do you have any like hot tips or maybe the, the lowest hanging fruit or just any advice that you would give, you know, existing founders in the Bitcoin industry? It's one of the pleasures of having been in that industry is some of the smartest people in the world. Getting back to some of the th things I was talking about, stories. Yeah. Even though Bitcoin is starting to make its inroads as an asset into Wall Street, I think some of the original stories that we have fallen short of that I think in many cases got hijacked by some of the ICO craze because everyone tapped into the same language. You know, when everyone is parading the same language, whether it's a scam or not, you need to change up the language uh, because you don't want to be associated with, you know, some of the ideas or some of the misuses of it. But the principles that underlie the language, which was financial sovereignty, which was monetary freedom, Figuring out ways to make that relevant to the mainstream audience again and again and again, because you can just can't over communicate enough. Um, I think that one of the dangers we have, and the good news is lots more people are doing this, but there's so much inside baseball talk, as they will, that the well is so deep. And there's so many topics, as you point out, that are just fascinating and multi layered. That uh, And once someone goes through the Bitcoin rabbit hole, they do get so immersed so quickly. But to figure out kind of how do we go from Bitcoin today to Bitcoin 10 or 20 years from now, where it is seen as just uh, another regular monetary option alongside anyone else, and that the average person could describe why, why Bitcoin not gold? Why are you holding 30% of your savings in Bitcoin versus US dollar? Or why Bitcoin, not Ethereum? Like Exactly. Why Bitcoin and not any of those other claimants to be digital coins or digital assets? There's a lot of work to be done on that messaging and simplification of that. And it just can't be done enough. And I find the same example we talked about where entrepreneurs suffer from the, the forbearance or the weight of knowing their thing too well, Bitcoiners suffer as well. The conversation with a Bitcoiner very quickly starts talking about Keynesian economics and this, and let me tell you about this, and figuring out a way to just keep it so stupidly simple and just repeat that simple message again and again and again is still, I think, work that has to be done. But I think it will really benefit us so it's not just seen as a get-rich-quick Wall Street, the latest new stock craze. And the same I would say of Tesla, by the way. So many people talk about Tesla because it makes them rich on the market versus talking about Tesla rewiring the world with clean energy. Elon has to continually move people back to our mission is, you know, save the planet. That's his mission. He doesn't care as much about cars. Cars was a means to an end. Mm -hmm. And I think Bitcoin is a means to an end. And keeping people focused on the end goal, which is monetary freedom, is really important and will be more, by the way. As we see more and more currency wars, as we see more currency collapses, that's all coming and been accelerated by the pandemic. As we see more trade wars and we see more uh, economic strife led to by ec economic inequality, by you know democracies failing around the world, whether or not you believe in climate crisis and climate change, certainly there is going to be climate related migration where you see entire countries or shorelines falling underwater and people having to move. The idea of carrying your wealth with you and being able to move it with full freedom and not being locked into a country that debases you and a country that can control the future of your assets is so critical. And the issues that Venezuela or Lebanon are suffering right now will be mainstream issues. And in fact, are going to be felt more and more by even G8 or mainstream countries as those countries start to debase. And so the idea of monetary freedom is going to become so critical and making everyone conversant in those topics and then being able to understand that Bitcoin is a solution to that, I think is still work that everyone has to do. Yeah, I agree. I, I do my best to challenge Bitcoiners when they rest in their laurels. And like I mentioned earlier, like I, I, I started to get sick of some of the memes like number go up because they end up translating a dumbed down version of Bitcoin to only mean like get rich fast or like this is asymmetric information. You know, congratulations, you're here. Like, I just don't like that perspective. And I think it makes for dumb, lazy Bitcoiners. And so I do try to challenge these kinds of things when I see them or when I can find ways to articulate different perspectives that allow people to come back to the actual utility of Bitcoin. Are there any like 
topics that we didn't talk about or questions that like people never ask you that you wish they did like anything like that you want to talk about before we go no i mean i think this is certainly pretty comprehensive and uh john thank you i mean i i haven't been out there kind of rushing for any chance but uh you know, just given our discussions and the fact you wanted to have this conversation publicly, I appreciate the opportunity to just be able to talk about some of the kind of the history and some of the perspective I have. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, it's been great getting to know you better this 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 year. And, you know, we, we only exchanged a couple of random tweets in the past years. And it was only recently that we started actually talking to each other, you know, on voice. And, and I really appreciate you, you know, not writing me off like some other people and taking me seriously and, and uh, you know, also helping, I guess, informally mentor me at times and, and taking the time to do this podcast with me. So thank you very much for doing this. And uh, I guess, do you have any anything you want to plug or anything you ways you want people to contact or you want to be left alone? No, I mean, it's fine. I mean, people can generally find me, my emails out there. I'm on Twitter. I don't make it super easy, but I don't make it that hard. So um, if, if it's something that someone really needs to reach out to me, they'll find a way, but uh, yeah, not plugging anything, just uh, you know, especially in these times, I will say this and you kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, I didn't kind of blow you off. It is one of my big frustrations. I think social media has been incredibly powerful in some respects, but so toxic in so many others. The cancel culture, the echo bubbles that come out of it and kind of the jump to out tweet someone or out win the, you know, meme wars. I just kind of really look at it as a weakening of discourse and it makes me really sad. So I, I don't judge how anyone spends their time, but I've made a point of, you know, conducting myself and trying to move away from some of the, those behaviors, both online and off. And I would encourage everyone to just try and be a bit kinder to each other because, you know, every industry has its rough edges and its learning curves, but uh, an industry that throws nothing but elbows at each other is just not one that's fun to be in. Well, I can definitely appreciate that. Or at least I can try to appreciate that better. Um, again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, have a great weekend. I can't wait to, wait to release this to everybody. Okay. Thanks a lot, John.